I didn't I didn't sell out, son. I bought in. Keep that in mind. Welcome to the Independent Characters, episode 248. This is Carl. This, this is Josh. Terrible. <laughs> yes. That's yeah, a good thing we practiced that ahead of time. Okay. <clears throat> Campbell and Josh are back, uh, which is awesome. And we got a lot to talk about today. Uh, we're going to discuss the evolution of 40K terrain, kind of where it's come from, where it used to be such a struggle, and now how there's such a dearth of it that you don't know what to get. Um, Spoiler alert, it's come a long ways. That is that is very, very true. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to throw out uh, our show is sponsored by Sion Hopes and uh, Peter Hoskin, two of our uh, Patreon subscribers. We appreciate your support very much. Uh, you can find out more about our Patreon at our website, theindependentcharacters.com. There's no A in independent. <laughs> there is an A in Patreon. It is <laughs> It is the <laughs> longest and worst <laughs> domain name. I swear to God, every time I got to type it into something, I'm like, I'm the independent. Carl, my checks are signed by Goonhammer. Like, yeah. <laughs> you, bad names are kind of par for the course here. There you go. All right. Uh, and speaking of Goonhammer, we are part of the Goonhammer Media Network, so you can check out media.goonhammer.com for more shows and information. Um, and then last but not least, please buy our t-shirts. <laughs> you can't see in the camera, but there's boxes of t-shirts back here. And my wife and Josh were like, are you going to get the order form up? Are you going to get the order form? <laughs> Finally, I got the order form up. Please go and and buy our t-shirts. We're selling them at a reasonable cost for very high quality t-shirts. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, and then just FYI, yeah, if you haven't seen the announcement on Facebook and Discord, and this is the first time you're hearing about it, T-shirts are back. Check it out yeah. at theindependentcharacters.com and get yourself a sweet new piece of swag. That's right. Hey, that was much. That was really good. That's almost like you practiced that wearable swag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we um, yeah, so we we have those available, and uh, they're they're great shirts. So, and I've ordered. Probably too many <laughs> of certain sizes, but you know what? I can use them for towels for cleaning my car when nobody buys them. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> let's let's stop with this nonsense. Launch right into elite choice. Uh, I'll go ahead and go first. My choice is Mark Kilburn and his Crute Scavengers diorama, which is absolutely stunning. Um, yeah. When I see people do this water effect, like the two inch or three inch deep water effect uh, using resin pores and, and such, uh, I panic a little bit because I can only imagine like the, the models that he painted are fantastic looking. And then you're like, and now I'm going to risk the whole thing <laughs> burying it in this resin. You got to have you got to have a sheer amount of confidence or insanity to do this kind of thing. And just the whole the whole diorama tells like this really cool looking story these crude you know this submerged uh uh, uh ig tank and they're kind of scavenging through it and there's fish underneath and everything it's it's absolutely stunning i was blown away by it so that's my take yeah this thing is real model railroader sicko mode over here <laughs> he added weld marks to all of the panels in the tank too which you didn't need to do you already had enough gray stuff going on but <laughs> sure let's just do that too which is one of those like it just adds so much verisimilitude that you would not expect out of a you know toy army tank and yeah. it just looks fantastic i love going through the effort of getting a beautiful Rogaldorn tank, building it, selectively messing it up and burying it under this resin, which looks super realistic. And like with a resin pour that deep, like resin gets hot when it cures. Yeah. I'd be worried about bubbles. I'd be worried, honestly, about it melting. Maybe I don't know what the melting point is of plastic here, uh, but there's even swimming crew down there. Like you can it's grab incredible. one of those. It's this is a crew pool party. And <laughs> layer by layer. Yeah. Part. That's it's like impressive. a crude hot tub. <laughs> it's, it's the, the, actually, you can't see it in the pictures I have in our show notes, but there is this crude, like kind of in the water 
behind the tank, like kind of looking in the hatch of it. And I just thought, oh, that's a, just such a great touch. Like the whole thing yeah. is just fantastic. The scale of that resin pour too is something else. Like I've seen a lot of scenic bases doing that, especially like a lot of golden demon entries in the last mm-hmm. couple of years. There's been a lot of uh, that kind of resin pour approach to it, but something on this scale, like this is an entire tank. And then some like this thing's easily a square foot. And then it's got <laughs> like three inches of poured resin in there. It's, it's really impressive it's and well done. Weigh like nine pounds. <laughs> yeah. You do that in like multiple layers, right? Like you don't just dump like all the resin in there and be like, there you go. I'm not I, it, sure in this case, honestly, uh, just it, because it, you don't see striations or anything like that, which right. down to polishing. I don't know the technique that well. But yeah, I don't know it very well either, but it's beautiful. Nice work. Nice work, yeah. man. Yeah. Josh, what do you got? All right. So I uh, I went with Dave Gormley's Cunning Orky Gubbins uh, for the Grand Narrative. And this is just an incredible uh, call out for what Dave has done. Uh, but not only that, not only did he make this amazing board, uh, which has a, like a bobble dice roller built in, working LED lights, all kinds of knobs and switches. Um, but then he also did the Destructa Crumpa, which is essentially his display board for his Grand Narrative <laughs> Army, uh, which is a Killican army of sorts. Uh, but it, he's basically scratch built out of uh, foam. Uh, some really high precision uh, pink pink foam work here using a... a, a foam cutting table i can only assume uh he, he's built a, a gargant of sorts <laughs> or uh, maybe it's a mega stompa whatever whatever you want to classify it it's a proper cunning orky construction here uh to the mad mad mech dave himself there um but it's yeah a, a big stompy um i'll, I'll call Orc it robot <laughs> For this for this purpose. Yeah. But inside it houses two stompas (laughs) as well as all the other cans and things that he has in there. And the fact that it unfolds and he's made this out of foam, it's it's really impressive. And I know he's he put a lot of time and effort into making it happen. It was uh, (laughs) he was definitely against the clock, like watching him over the last the course of this last week. Yeah. uh, Phase by phase of like the planning phase, the foam phase, the it's assembled phase. Now I need to paint it in like three days phase. Uh, but it's, it's just a really neat way and super orky thing. And uh, again, Dave with his uh, con cosplaying orky armor and things like that. It's just uh, the, the perfect addition to that. And you got the, the board, the stompa and the cosplay all going on there. So and he took it. I don't know where he lives, but I don't think it's near right near the like, I don't know if he flew there or drove. I hope he drove there. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's in Chicago to, to my recollection. Chicago and this is in Atlanta, I believe yeah, is, yeah, is so. the. So we got to ride in the uh, the carpool lane the whole way with this little uh, big <laughs> That's neck. right. That's Just right. Put it in the passenger seat. Drive in the HOV lane. The yeah, whole exactly. Time. It's, fine. <laughs> uh, it's it's sick. This is very much par for the course for Dave. Like, yeah. And I yeah. don't mean that in any like a yawn way. It's like no, he's all, <laughs> of course he's going to do something. He's always over the top. Thing. Like uh, yeah. I first saw his stuff at the Grand Narrative in New Mexico in 2022, and he had this super elaborate, big, sick display board that was very much along these lines but not this fun like the thing opens up i bet it's magnetized those orcs don't slide off it's so cool and um actually i was on warcom earlier today and i saw uh just posting the show notes this picture of him and a ton uh, i saw it all, both all geared yeah. up yeah. which is so fun i'm, I'm glad I, you know dave is one of those guys that like is the quintessential orc player mm-hmm. like yes. Like he is, when I think about orc players, like he is actually the first one that pops in my head. Uh, and, and so like, I mean, we've known him for years now, but man, he always just brings, <laughs> brings the heat, um, uh, that picture in particular, I'm su- I'm super excited at Don and he are out there. Uh, but that picture, I always look at a Don and I go, he looks like, I think I posted, he looks like an Imperial guardsman trying to be undercover with the orcs <laughs> and blend in. <laughs> How do you do fellow boys? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey boys. He, We're going to go crumping, right? <laughs> His public service officer pass. He cannot escape it. So he, that's right. Uh, undercover orc. I love it. <laughs> that's right. Let's get, let's get those shooter boys onto their truck <laughs> spelled with a C. <laughs> he did. He actually did a lot of work yeah, in his, you know, his costuming stuff too. It looks fantastic. So, and, and then he's painting, of course, to the last minute as I yeah. knew he would be. So, so exciting times out in the, uh, at the, uh, Warhammer narrative event couldn't do it this year campbell would you pick 
Uh, I picked uh, the elusive Sean and their Death Shroud Terminators. They're so also good. on the Badcast Discord. So yeah. double dipping in two very good communities here. Yeah. And they painted a squad of six of these, which, sorry, my cat is in the way of my microphone. Uh, they <laughs> painted a full squad mm-hmm. of six of these. And they just look, there's just such a good execution of a theme, of an idea on some models that are really busy and I'll be honest, intimidating, like even to me as a painter, like the fact that they were able to take these models, which have so much going on and still make them look grounded is like a skill in and of itself, because yeah, you could just spray paint them green and slop them all over with a bunch of washes, but they picked out their colors very intentionally. They got some really nice contrast with these like desaturated purples against yeah. these very dirty brown greens. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Those like parts of the color triad working together and they just pop off these Martian rusty desert based is so marvelously i love the weathering they've got on all the brass like on the bells and all that and i love that they've just got like everything is very clear and easy to pick out there's mm-hmm. good texture variety even the tentacles that are like gripping the sides are glossy which is so gross and looks gotta have so that slime right. yeah the and, stomach mouth is is awesome yeah and just the rust effects look so like again, it's the, it's the tetanus effect you know i don't want to touch these things but they look fantastic <laughs> uh they are definitely death death guard as a whole is a faction that i do not have any interest in painting because of mm-hmm. all the tentacles mouth teeth etc it's uh, the best part <laughs> i i know that's the appeal for some folks but i hate painting that stuff uh, so oh, i love it when other people are doing a good job with it you know i typically like justin has said this in the past too and i know other like painters have and they're like oh yeah purple and green go well together and usually i'm like looks a little clownish to me but this case where it's like this as you said desaturated kind of purple yeah, with the, this is this is how it matches really well like that was actually one of the first things i noticed in the group shot that you had put up i was like oh those purples look really good against this and and as you go to the zoomed in ones i'm like yeah that was just an excellent color choice as well as, as you said the bells with the um vertigris on the mm-hmm. on the bells looks yeah. just solid and solid using pink as a spot color for the extra gross stuff like the flies and yeah some guts was also just really inspired move i think you do bring up like purple green pink that can be really clownish it makes you think like if they're really saturated you think of the incredible hulk or the yeah. joker or whatever right but if you play it more you know in a desaturated sort of fashion it can look very it can look grounded like this it looks like it's belongs right yeah. <laughs> like yeah 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 solid work man holy smokes these look good and keep pulling from from the Discord of of uh, the Badcast. Like, love sharing that stuff too. It's a great community mm-hmm. as well. So it's it's a big old Venn diagram. Yeah, All right, some good so overlap. let's let's go ahead before we launch into the workbench, Campbell. Mm-hmm. What what are you drinking? Oh well, yeah, well of course we're going into the grip and rip section of the show. Hell yeah, brother. Uh, there you go. In, <laughs> in honor of uh, the 40K Badcast, what, what are you drinking? I got me a uh, Zoigel Pills from Zoigel House in Portland, Oregon. You try all kinds of different stuff. I try not to get the same thing twice if I can help it. Oh, interesting. Okay. They're, I'm kind of the, yeah. I find something I like and I stick with it. No, so that, that's how I approach armies, which is why I just keep painting power armor and guardsmen <laughs> over and over again. Uh, but when it comes to beverages and so on, I try to, you know, variety is the spice of life. I continue with the, uh, acai, uh, super dry beer from Japan, which says, uh, in quotes along the top, Karakuchi. I don't know what that means, <laughs> it but it sounds good to me. Does it say, <laughs> I don't know what that means in quotation marks. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, what are you drinking? <laughs> Uh, I'm taking a, a page out of the uh, occasional Dan Boyd school of beverage drinking while recording and going for a tasty uh, sparkling water here of the Waterloo. Uh, what do I got? A cherry limeade. Oh, that's what I'm well, refreshing. That's, that's right. yeah. yeah. Delicious. All right. Let's talk hobby progress. I haven't done much of anything. Uh, I was supposed to do some airbrushing with Shell, teaching her how to use airbrush on her uh, Vindicator that we got her and got assembled. Uh, but other than that, I did get the new uh, Chaos Lord and the new Chaos Lord with Jump Pack. Uh, I have only assembled the on foot Chaos Lord. And <clears throat> again, it's one of those things where it's like, I got this Chaos Lord and like they arrive in the mail and she'll go, oh, what's what's that? And I go, well, it's this new Chaos Lord. She goes, oh, don't I need one of those too? And I'm like, 
No, no, you don't. You aren't just default buying two of Chaos new releases. No, I think we're going to get to the point where I'm like, you go place the order. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is starting to get ridiculous. Like, I'm only going to hold your hand so much before I get cooties. So, oh, wait a minute. I've been married almost 25 years. I think I got the cooties. <laughs> the cooties are coming from inside the house, Carl. <laughs> yeah, this is this is literally the only thing I have uh, worked on. Like, I've been kind of busy at work, but I can make 100 excuses other than uh you know space marine <laughs> too <laughs> but I, I think i'm i'm kind of begging off again of, of space marine 2 a bit as uh i'm waiting for some expansion stuff to come out at this point so uh let's go over to josh yeah so i had a pile of things i was working on last episode as you're talking about and i was able to get them all across the finish line there mm-hmm. so finished off the storm speeder thunder strike yeah. Uh, I, I do want to go back and add just a little bit of weathering. I had to get them done just in time for a game last night, which I'll talk about in the next edge section here. Uh, but I, I got them all varnished at least there. And I'm going to go back and do just a little bit of weathering to, to add on top of that. The, uh, Brutalis dreadnought similar, got that all, all done varnished, got it up to, uh, tabletop ready there i will go back and add a little bit of weathering on top of that and probably do a little bit of blood effects on the talons there uh jump pack chaplain got that guy done uh finished the uh primaris captain that i had going on and then 10 uh jump pack intercessors got them all gone done also um and these ones i did a um the jet effect on them because i'm not a fan of each guy's kind of like pirouetting off of like a concrete little kind of hero rock, if you will, as, as you do going through it. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, <laughs> so the fact that every single jump pack intercessor has something like that going, I was like, you know, I, I don't usually go for the battlefield effects type of uh, kind of like resin additions with, you know, missiles being launched, blast muzzle yeah. fire, things like that. But this, this felt right for the jump pack intercessors. Uh, I'm really happy with how it turned out, but at the same time, because I did a vibrant kind of like a, a wet blend of, yellow to orange to red to like a purple red to, to like a dark gray at the bottom of that. It is so vibrant against this really gray army that yeah. like, I'm happy with how it turned out and it feels like it's too much at the same time within a different army. I think it would fit right in. I was like this, this unit definitely pops on the board compared to the rest of the army. Now. Yeah. I heard uh, you but- saying that last night at the guild house to your opponent. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, and I went over and looked, I was really impressed though with the work that you had done. These look fantastic. Yeah. Those yeah. look beautiful, but I am absolutely seeing those before I see the dudes. Yeah, absolutely. You abs- yeah, it's a yeah. distraction technique, Josh. Yeah. What you do is you have these on the table. Your opponent can do nothing but focus on these. Meanwhile, give them the old what for. <laughs> well, so, yeah, funny, funny story. These guys were absolutely the MVPs of my army. Oh. Night, which I, I have not heard good things about jump packs with uh, jump pack intercessors, but these guys, uh, it'll be they, they, they did an incredible job. And I'll get to that in the next segment. Right on. Campbell, yeah. what about you? Uh, so I also haven't gotten to finish all that much. I've been starting to work on some Imperial Guard stuff. I built the Castellan, one of like the dozen things in Warhammer called a Castellan, but the Cadian Castellan <laughs> and some of the Warhammer Plus slash event models. So like Commissar's Duty, which is the dude doing execution and that one Kasserkin based on the Karl Kapinski artwork. So I built mm-hmm. all those just so I can basically get them out of my backlog and have some fun character models to work on as palette cleansers down the line. But I'm working on my first Cadian squad. And I think it's probably, I think I've got my Cadian painting process down to like four or five hours of uh, miniature, which is not bad. But then you think like, oh, 40 hours to paint a 50 point squad or whatever. This is, this is going to take a while. Uh, Sisters so are the same way. <laughs> yeah. So, well, like, I don't have to, but of course I'm like, well, I've got the Cadian. I've got his uniform. I've got like two tones there. Each thing needs like a three stage highlight. So it looks really good. <laughs> then they got to do the weathering and the transfers and every skin tone is going to be different. So it's taken a hot minute, but they're most of the way done. All of them done for the next episode. Wow. Who knows? I might work on something else after that, but I'm having a good time with it. I really like like, as I kind of alluded to earlier, I like painting Marines and Guardsmen. Just yeah. dudes with rifles is a lot of fun for me. Yeah. So I'm very happy to work on just it's, it's comfort food for me, honestly. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah Josh, again, did I, I don't know if I skipped something that you did. I, I didn't mean to like no, jump that, to yeah. Campbell. Okay. That, that felt like enough. Actually, okay, yeah. more things, but I'll talk about it next episode. They look great. They, they, yeah. they do look great. Um, let's, uh, go into games played and we'll start with Campbell. This time let's go the other direction. 
All right. So we are still in our 40K league, and I had two league games since the last episode. And the first one was, was against Shane's Dark Angels. Uh, mind you, the first game was against Dark Angels as well, but this was a slightly different build. This ah, one, Shane. Classic that guy. Shane. Yeah. <laughs> this one didn't have the lion, but did have Azrael and a whole buttload of armor. Like, I was surprised he wasn't running oh, Storm. Uh-huh. He had like a uh, Gladiator Executioner. He had two Vindicators in there. I think he had like a Ballistas or two. He, it was a lot of stuff supported with Deathwing Knights and so on. 2000 and, point game? 2000 point game, yeah. Okay. And I played kind of dumb, I'll be honest. Like, I had my scouts out <laughs> in the front so they could just kind of do some screening and I just kept forgetting to pick them up or move them or anything of the sort. So they were just, they were scoring some secondary points, but they weren't really living up to their fullest and they got kind of just bushwhacked as a result and i rarely blame my dice as like my main culprit here but this is one of those games where i'm like all right cool my flamestorm cannon shoot your terminators and you passed nine out of ten your (laughs) six yeah tight love that for you that's not your dice that's his dice (laughs) doing well it it went both ways because i'm like cool i've got a four inch charge if i make this four inch charge i will get in with my blade guard into your tech marine getting me assassinate getting me uh taking your objective yeah it would have been like a cascade of points and i failed this four inch charge i rolled oh. a three on it and i was out of command points for a reroll so i'm like cool this is great and when i did make those charges like i barely get in there and he always had the two command points to use the uh, gladius task force fight on death strategy mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. I'm like cool my crusaders wipe out your inner circle and then you wipe me out in return cool nice. rounds two. my crusaders wipe out your deathwing knights get wiped out in return and he was hmm. definitely playing like a good game he had just gotten out of a tournament so he'd gotten a lot of reps in with this list a little more recently than i had so he was a sharper player for it and between my dice just beefing it reliably like every las cannon every multi melta it'd be a one to hit a one to wound or a one for damage or all three and it was just one of those games, and I lost 46 yeah. to 100. Oh, that's a shellacking, yeah, as it, the it old was, people say. It was pretty <laughs> rough. Yeah, it was a gloss varnishing. <laughs> <laughs> what? Where does that statement come Where does that say come from? It's a still, shellacking. Well, shellack is like when you seal something. That's what I thought. Nice, so, yeah. I don't know. It's like a proper lacquer. Yeah, I don't understand. Yeah, like I'll a, have to look that up later. All right. All right, what else you got? Yeah, let's learn things <laughs> together on this show. Yeah. Um, my second game was against Josh. Not this Josh, but a different Josh. Uh, and his Josh. Salamanders. Yeah, classic Josh. Josh classic like Josh. <laughs> oh, man, I used to play Salamanders too. It's yes, you did. Game. We had some great Salamanders games. Nice. So yeah. this was uh, my third game of the league. He was running Firestorm with a fluffy Salamanders list with like a 10-strong squad of Infernus Marines, yeah. aggressors with Flamestorm Cannons, Adrax Agatoni, like a whole bunch of cool stuff. A couple Dreadnoughts in there, a Rep X. Like it was a pretty fun list. Being, and, I'm not not familiar. Adrax Agatoni is... He's, uh, he's the Salamanders Primaris character guy. Oh, okay. I don't okay. Quite know what he does because I don't think josh used him very well he was kind of okay. hanging out in the back and <laughs> he did whack a guy with a hammer and then i made my saves and killed him back so gotcha. i really know what he does i know um, he's not italian but in my head the second you said that the tarantella <laughs> oh, played yeah, no, I, was <laughs> Agato- Agatoni. <laughs> I was calling him big tone the entire game yeah. <laughs> so i think if he yeah he's at the very least like culturally italian <laughs> so I played ah! aggressively at Warhammers for everybody, Campbell. I know yeah. it is. <laughs> uh, so I play aggressively out of the gate because I'm like, you know, he's kind of in a refused flank, more or less. I know he's going to come at me and use the flamer stratagem with the devastating wounds. So I want to kind of prepare for that. So I'm like, here we go. Here's his impulsor for, full of stern guard, four las cannons. Uh, all right, they all hit and two, 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 two. nothing but twos for wounds. I'm like, okay, <laughs> it's going to be one of these games, isn't it? My assault intercessors run up. Uh, jumpy boys to take out his scouts get an early kill get some objective play four inch charge what do you know i failed this one too let's re-roll it fail that one too I'm like Ooh. all right cool this is this is gonna be go- i've changed my dice since the last game too like this shouldn't be <laughs> happening. Uh, but fortunately even though i played like pushed up aggressively i was still fairly well hidden from his rep x and his like gladiator and his uh ballistas dreadnought so i didn't really take much of a beating back and in turn two 
I just start rolling out. I my dice start getting hot. I start blowing up his vehicles. Uh, vehicles are actually exploding, which is always fun. Nice left and right. My blade guard. I get him into. I get him out. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna charge his inferno marines. He's gonna Overwatch me, but I'm in my head. I'm like, what's worse, ten d six of Overwatch flamer fire or ten d six of devastating wounds flamer fire? I know which one I'd rather deal with. Uh, he only kills two on Overwatch. I slap right in there and blade guard with the chaplain. They make a uh, regular power armored guys go away very quickly. Mm. Just a hot tip yeah. for me. For mm-hmm. that one. Uh, and from there they pile into his ballistas. They, they just hang out the entire game. They never die. They just keep chewing stuff up, which rules. He drops my home objective with his terminator squad and his captain. He makes a long bomb charge to take my like scout squad off it. And I'm like, all right, he could burn my objective and get a bunch of points. Cause it's uh, the mission where you burn objectives for extra points. Yeah. But, Helbrecht is right there, as are his boys. And uh, Helbrecht alone clears out more than half of that Terminator squad, and the Power Fists do the this rest. Guy, this guy. The Helbrecht. Classic Helbrecht. Living up to his name. <laughs> and then after that, on my next turn, gets back in his transport and rolls out forward to start burning it <laughs> oh, and nice. more stuff. Yeah. So I've basically <laughs> broken his offensive push at this point, and most of my stuff is still on the board in at least pretty good shape. And I'm able to kind of clean up what's left grab some objectives and I table him on turn five. Uh, so, wow. Yeah. So this was a pretty big 80 <clears throat> 30 win for me, uh, but it was my first time playing as Josh and I always played him a lot. Like he was a really sweet dude. Great not this Josh. Manager's army. No, not, not this Josh. No, <laughs> Nothing no. like this Josh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this when, which is funny because when Josh, not when this Josh and I did play, I accidentally cheated because <laughs> we, uh, ne- we played Necromunda and I missed typical Campbell. Typical oh Campbell. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the technicality went after the fact. It's yeah. like, oh, oh, we just played it wrong. But yeah. Reading we both agreed how we played it. Speaking of idea. speaking of Josh's, Josh, what have you played? Yeah, so I uh, I played two games. Uh, first game I played last week was a game of Legions Imperialis. Uh, and this is against a local guy who's only played, I think this is his fourth game of it. Uh, he's still painting his army, and his army was like in, in progress on the painting desk. So mm-hmm. He actually uh, requested just because this is the only time scheduling really worked out. If I could split my 3000 point army into two uh, 1500 point forces. So I made two pretty balanced forces splitting it up this way. It's definitely not like optimized for how the game wants you to play, but right. um, they were really well balanced against each other. So I ended up having a super fun match, uh, very tactical back and forth. Um uh, and uh, he uh, he's uh, this local guy, Ruben. He's still like <laughs> new to he he played Epic. Uh, Love his sandwiches, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have a comment on everybody's name yeah. this episode. That's <laughs> that's what I'm going for. <laughs> Rachel. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah. So he 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 was very familiar with like Space Marine, Space Marine Second Edition, Epic, all all the previous iterations of this, and he's. Um, kind of still still taking Legion Imperials for uh, a test drive to see if he, yeah. he likes the game enough to, to like really, really dive deep into it. Um, uh, it ended up being super fun game, very close, very tactical. I, like I was up three points the entire game. Uh, so like not not a lot. They're, they're <coughs> lower scoring games. They're not a like 100 point scale like 40K is. Um, but on the model side, he he spent a lot of his early activations using Overwatch, which mm-hmm. means he he was putting the hurt on my models a bit more, but sacrificing position for that. So I was able to get like a points lead on that, but I was definitely down bodies. So towards the end of the game, I I was controlling one objective pretty soundly. He was controlling one objective pretty soundly. And then the middle objective, we had a big fight over. Um, and I I had uh, a handful of, of tricks and some bodies because I, I didn't have I think I had two tanks left where he had mostly tanks, but I had a ton of infantry left and infantry are, do a better job at securing objectives in Legion of Perils compared to vehicles. Um, so I was able to kind of just do a, a, a mad rush at the end to, to grab the, the center objective there. And we ended up calling it with time. Uh, but had we gone in the, the final turn of that, I think with just my, my last pile of bodies jumping into that middle objective would have been able to clinch the, uh, the s- sound sound victory there, but it was a super close game, super fun. Um, definitely uh, in- enjoy that game so much. <laughs> and nice. then last night played a game of 40 K <laughs> went over to the guild house in San Jose, which yeah. um, for me is a bit further than Carl uh, was raining was, last night. And there was, was that your first time there? 
first time to the guild house. Yeah. 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 It's That's pretty a cool. cool. Yeah. yeah. It's a good, it's a good spot. Um, yeah. Having beer and food and tons of tables and all, all the other things going on with all the, uh, the esports and the, the video game cafe side of things. Like it, it, it's neat. Uh, the lighting is not the best for, for not, playing 40 yeah. K. It's not, I've seen worse. Like actually the play hall at LVO or uh, not LVO Campbell, uh, at Nova mm-hmm. was darker than guild. Yeah. Where the tournament was at <laughs> Nova was that was rough. No, the Nova Open last year was a was like playing at a junior prom. Like the yeah, <laughs> mood lighting. No wonder I felt so frisky. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. So I played uh, a fifteen hundred point game against Graham and his Zinch Demons, uh, and yeah. I brought the Shark Sharkadons out for war, including all the freshly painted additions to to the force there. Um. Graham, Graham set up there because I was stuck in some really bad traffic trying to get over there. Uh, and I would say this this is a very like classic, very assaulty army against a very shooty army. And it's going to like you hope that it's the very close game, but it tends to be more one way or the other. It goes it, <coughs> one, like, towards one side or the other. Um, he infiltrated uh, two units of blue horrors up there. So they were pretty close. So me being an aggressive assault army was able to jump on those very quickly and just murder, uh, murder, murder some horrors, and then just keep that momentum carrying through. So I ended up, uh, yeah, just rolling, rolling through them pretty, pretty hard. The, the assaults were working. I didn't realize just how, I guess viable when, (laughs) when you only have single wound models for the most part, like he had flamers, he had screamers, uh, 22 units of 10 pink horrors, two units of 10 blue horrors that had the potential to split. Yep. But if you wipe them out and there's no bottles left, they don't get the chance to split. And just, I have two, two big hammer units just, uh, with assault, uh, assault intercessors coming out of a land raider and then the 10 jump pack intercessors led by the chaplain and like they were just murdering everything um i got lucky yeah, with they're my- not they're not they're not super tough but they are resilient if you leave them there i mean they're they're splitting on a four plus right yeah. and then the the blues are splitting uh on a four plus again to put like little cinder horrors out or whatever they're called and those things actually can mess yeah. you up because those things can yeah. cause mortal wounds uh yeah when they get in combat, I feel didn't like- didn't get to see them because they all died before <laughs> before co- coming to the party. Assault intercessors are a really good counter to that unit anyway, for sure. Because yeah, oh, they've yeah. got invuln saves. Well, who cares? They're chain swords, and you've got a buttload of them. And I, I think I, you're winning. I was rolling a pilot, like I felt like an orc player. I was rolling so many yeah. dice for marines, which was you know I I don't think I've ever rolled that many dice. Yeah, <laughs> with, with yeah, yeah, yeah. ever. <laughs> so it, it was really it was good. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. Um, the mortal wounds off the charge for the jump pack assault intercessors. And then the chaplain has a chance at the start of the fight phase to do additional mortal wounds on there. I, and of course he was maxing that out every time um, for the, the jump pack chaplain. So I uh, like on a charge, I was doing an average of like seven mortal wounds. So things <laughs> were just dying before I even got a chance to start swinging. <laughs> that's sword. brutal. Like, yeah, wow. That's okay. brutal. Well, that's good. I'll take that. Um, yeah. I got really lucky with a, a sun thunder strike shooting turn one and uh, did, I think 12 wounds to fate weaver. So he just, <laughs> Failed Jeez, three of the. Uh, oh, that rules. He failed two of the three invuln saves of damage that went through, and then I just rolled really hot. I always if it's d six plus one, like I'm guaranteed to roll a one. So I'm like my land raider has never done more than two damage until last <laughs> night. Uh, so uh, yeah, I took took Fate Weaver down turn one to I think he was down to seven wounds. So then he like his turn uh, I went first, so he ended up hiding Fate Weaver, kind of took him out of the game. Fate Weaver has an indirect fire thing uh, that he was able to shoot hiding in a corner and my mm. save showed up for that. It's like the, the dice went in my favor. <laughs> that was like the, the one time armor saves really went in my favor was against Fate Weaver. And then the uh, jump pack uh, assault intercessors were actually able to take Fate Weaver out just on those mortal wounds on the charge. Yeah. Uh, yeah so wow. like it, every, everything just, they really were your anywhere. MVPs. Yeah, they, they they took out a unit of blue horrors. They took out a unit of pink horrors. They took out a unit of screamers, and they took out fate weaver in three <laughs> turns. God. Yeah, that, wow, that is yeah. crazy good. I mean, the, the I mean, the thunder realistic. strike really brought fate weaver down to make him at a killable threshold. But yeah. yeah, it was they 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 did some work. I was very impressed with that unit. 
after I left last night, I was looking up because I also own a Zeech demon army and I was looking up like, okay, what, what are some like viable Zeech demon army lists? And like pretty much unanimously people are like, yeah, they're real mid right now. <laughs> like real, yeah. they're, you know, the big, they the just lack a lot. Really good. The little stuff, not so great. The flamers. It, did it work, depends. Like. Yeah. It depends on how it's used. So, um, but it's just, it's, yeah, it's just not the best right now. I'm curious to see what happens when the demon codex comes out. So yeah. Yeah. And hopefully Monogod builds are, are something that, you know, I'm they hoping exploit with, through formations. With these detachments you're getting in there, like you'll get a mono God build for each, but then a, exactly. a, a, hopefully a couple good mix options. That just I'd love it. Play. Yeah. 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 I'd love I'd, it. Uh, yeah. Zinch teams obviously aren't in, in the best place right now. And that matchup again, being potentially of a hard swing one way or another with assault versus shooty. I will say, I think Graham set up the board and I think he actually put maybe a little bit too much terrain on the board. Um, no, for, such especially thing. him. Well, him being the shooty army, like he wasn't yeah. able to shoot me that much and yeah. me being assaulting, getting in there. Like, um, yeah, anyways, super, super fun game. It's the first time I played against Graham. Great, great guy. We had had a blast, even though the game ended up being pretty one sided. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was really cool to check out the venue and, and get a fun game of 40K. Josh, you've been kind of you've expressed to me that you've been a little disappointed in the way your army plays. Uh kind of against type like for, for the shark shark yeah, uh, yeah. how do you feel about how they did last night? And have you taken units that correct that or are you playing so, it under a different, what I did codex? different last night is I'm actually playing it under blood angels. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the liberator assault group makes it an assault army. I'm not using any of I'm like, I'm you're never special, gonna characters. special characters in this army. <clears throat> I'm never going to bring sanguinary guard, anything like that. Like, so it's, but the, I think it's as close as you get thematically yeah. to what this army is supposed to be. Right? It matches close enough, cl- as close as possible to the rules. When I started this army back in fifth edition, like they just get bonuses to strength or attacks, depending on like I Tybris doesn't even exist anymore. He's just a generic right. Terminator captain now and can't even have his weapon loadout. So uh, the, the army doesn't exist as intended anymore, but this as as close as possible that replicates like going all the way back to fifth edition. When I started this army, bringing that to life, on the table and it's just how i've just like that i want to play this army yeah. as a, an aggressive assault army it's it's how they they work in the lore and these rules happen to fit that um and, and it was it was really fun to see that happen and bring that to life um the uh, yeah and you know i'm it was kind of a weird, weird choice for me because back like again back in fifth edition especially when you know you had blue blue vulcans running around there and Mm -hmm. every chapter had these special characters that were because in fifth edition you needed that special character in order to unlock the those chapter tactics uh that's where quite honestly that's where like it didn't sit well with me like yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah. and and i mean i know i'm being like picky about it but it was like oh really another oh look ultramarines no no they're playing with uh this is vulcanus you know, <laughs> yeah. and, 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 you know, I, I, and John Fearhelm, I know for a fact that you did it too. And I was like, oh, I hate this. And I told him, I was like, oh, I hate this, but you know, to each their own, but I like the way they've done it now. It actually makes sense. I think what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and like, it, I'm, I'm not a special character guy anyways, <clears> especially <throat> since post, but not everything's you know, leveraged you, against you, special characters it's, anymore. Exactly, so it's really not yeah. relevant. And, that really hasn't been the case since fifth edition. So it's, you know, I've happily moved away from special characters, but this, like I, I had some mixed feelings, just applying a different rule set to, to the yeah, set. Cause I get technically it. they are codex Marines, but they, they also don't operate like codex Marines. They are just from the lore and, you know, yeah. every, any yeah. standpoint. Um, and, and I have a very lore thematic list. Like I've got, I've got scouts even before scouts were cool and got a ton of scouts and, uh, I've got the, the red brethren terminator squad, which weren't in the 1500 point list, but uh, like, it's definitely something that over the 10 years I've been working on this army now, like has been a, a big part of how I've built and how I've approached it. Sure. Um, sure. But, but yeah, last night compared to the, the, I, I'd say I've only played maybe three, three other games with them in 10th edition with the sharks. Most other games have been Necrons for 10th. Um, but it sounds like you were most excited about how they performed last night. It's definitely was yeah. the, the most fun I've had playing <coughs> them and, and bring it to it. And some of that was the new, new units that didn't suffer from new, new model uh, syndrome. They, they did quite well instead of just dying terribly. Yeah. I will say the Brutalis didn't do anything. Not no. at all. Like, well, I think it's important that you enjoy playing the army you're playing, right? Yeah. Like if, if, 
again, I dropped Marines just because I was like, you know, yeah. it's gotten stale for me and, and I'm moving on. Um, but I think it's always important that you enjoy playing what you're yeah. playing. And if things are clear, like, it's clear. You're Carl, you're going to be my most regular player, right? So yeah, probably. I think, I think these two armies are going to be a really fun matchup <laughs> also. Like I'm not bringing yeah. any of the, the, the I'm switching to Eldar. Hyper competitive. <laughs> I've got them. Too. Yeah, saw that for you. Did you so, see the new <laughs> yeah. models are incredible. I am so excited, especially the, this um, is the, this is the today they announced. Yeah, yeah, today they announced the the new lords and and a bunch of the aspect warriors came out in plastics. So the warp spider, uh, thing God, he looks like, so good. Yeah, mommy of all legs. Model. Yeah, but he like, looks just awesome. Ah, uh, it's it's a lady phoenix lord. She looks uh, awesome. But the the, the spider like details. I'm not assuming all. anything. <laughs> The six limbs and then even the you know, eyes like the, the mandibles and the eyes it's very like paying attention to the spider but not in a like gimmicky cartoony way like it's, nah, it's it, really cool yeah, it's awesome i'm yeah. super excited I think warp spiders was- have always been my favorite aspect warrior so very excited to get them in plastic yeah that model was i think the third time during that reveal stream that i cussed out loud alone in my <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice yeah, that was a that was for as nothing burger as nova was this was yeah. right yeah. this was a big honking like fud ruckers full pound cheeseburger with all yeah. the fixings of, of yeah materials. yeah it was yeah. good good stuff good stuff g-dub um that, uh, that uh, release actually has me a little bit tall i was hoping to get all of my uh eldar ready to go for january but now i'm like oh i don't think the codex is going to drop till maybe end of january early february yeah you're gonna I'm be waiting so i I may actually uh, now prioritize getting the uh, sharks up to the full 2000 points and just have them ready to go for all of next year. And then uh, get Eldar as the and paint. I think Eldar. that's a good move. That's the new stuff drops out there. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I saw you at Guildhouse last night because I was playing a game there as well. I got to play John uh, and his orcs. Anytime player rocks up with orcs, I, I have a very bad win loss. <laughs> ratio to orcs like i tend to lose the orcs uh regularly could be also that the orc players i'm typically playing are usually pretty good players like i play you know robo ed from life after the cover save i played doug johnson who's a much better player of this game than i am um <clears throat> uh and john is a pretty good player as well uh but uh you know you were talking about dice campbell earlier and uh josh will tell you you know, there was a point where I was about to quit dice games because I just like a total. Nothing was happening. Uh, this game I was hitting a lot, and then he would just make every save and like just five up saves or five up with four up feel no pains or whatever. And then I started rolling bad, and I swear I failed so many uh, uh, dark packs this game. <laughs> like, oh, no. like I, I at one point uh, as his orcs were bearing down on my vindicator, which had done okay damage. Uh, we kind of, the whole army's kind of met in the middle. Like we had this big tussle right in the middle of the, the, the board where my demon prince faced off against his orc warlord. I slaughtered his orc warlord, but he had a fight after death ability and then was able to kill the demon prince right then too. So it was pretty amazing how that all worked out. But as the orcs were like, as they were bearing down on my vindicator, I had like three points left on my vindicator and I'm like, oh man. All right. Well, you know what? I'm gonna fire Overwatch. <laughs> you know? Oh, dark pact. Oh, look, I failed. Oh, look, I blew up my own land <laughs> or my own vindicator. <laughs> it's like okay, and it didn't explode, but I was like, you don't get to kill it because I already killed it. <laughs> you know, I took it off. The- it denies him the charge move too. Like it did. It, it yeah, did yeah. deny him the There's charge move. Four dimensional chess going on here. With that's killer right. Modes. Yeah, let's say that's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> it was all part of the plan. Uh, you know, as the game progressed, though, like it. it it, we played all five rounds and it was really not determined who was winning till kind of like every round it was like, Oh, I think I'm in trouble. Oh, now I'm, Oh, I think I'm in trouble now I'm winning. And, uh, um, we had literally switched sides of the board, like from where we started, there was so much movement and so much, you know, action going on. I had obliterators, <laughs> not the best use of obliterators, but I had them deep strike down, kill a bunch of grots. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing bear, bear with me here's the thing the grots were sitting on his objective which i needed um and this was the mission where you would get objectives and then you could guard the objective mm-hmm. so you had to own the objective at the start of your turn and then say i'm going to guard it and then at the end of their turn if you still own the objective you got two additional points and these grots man 
talk about a great unit for holding objectives. Holy smokes, they're like two Brots OP win or, games. They're like yeah. two two objective control points per grot, and they're like f- fifty points for like. They also dawn. generate command points. Yes, uh, sometimes too. They're very good for this specific purpose. Yeah. Yeah. So listen, all in all, like two obliterators dropping down and then just going, you know what? I'm going to push you off this objective with these guys. And I'm even going to charge your stupid grots <laughs> and finish them off uh, was actually turned out to be worth it because in those, uh, those oblits sat on that objective kind of moving, you know, within range of it, shooting at other stuff, but sat there as a threat and owning that objective and getting me guard points. <laughs> it was just like, yeah, come on over. And he couldn't bring his, big he didn't have it wasn't the i don't even know what this vehicle was i can't remember i'm not the best with the orc units but it, it was a vehicle i'd not played against before and it had like this psychic flamer cannon on the thing yes the kill rig with the yes yes the kill rig that stupid kill rig uh, yes that yeah, kill rig cool. man <laughs> it was so customized it looked really cool um, but that was the thing that did the most damage to my Vindicator. <laughs> I was like, oh, it almost took it out in one go. Um, but then, uh, you know, he couldn't. The problem was his kill rig was on an objective. And at one point he's like, well, it's going to guard the objective. There's nothing else for me to do over here. And and then he was like, he didn't want to move it off the objective <laughs> the whole time. So he's wasting, you know, it's like when you have a Terminator sitting on an objective, it's like, Oh, what, you know, what am I doing? You know, what did I do wrong? Uh, but yeah, this battle in the middle was incredible. I threw kind of everything at it. I threw legionnaires. I threw the demon prince. I threw terminators. My land raider fired into it. I took out the war boss along with his retinue. I killed a huge squad of boys there. Um, ended up destroying one of the trucks there. I held the center. I held, I ended up just holding enough. And this was honestly, Campbell, you talked about that hundred point game. Like I've never had a game go to a hundred points. This was probably the highest point level game I've ever gotten to. And it was 75 points to 74 at the end. And I took it by one point. And it's just yeah. like, but I mean, we were like calculating out like, okay, what can you do? And and then he had to draw two cards at the end. And I'm like, please don't get a good card. <laughs> please don't get a good card. And he drew one. He's like, ah, this one's okay. And then he drew another. He's like, I'm going to burn a command point to draw another card. I'm like, oh God, no. And then he drew another one. He's like, ah, this isn't much better. <laughs> so it was like, he wasn't able to really pull it off, but he was able to get like within a point at that point. But it had swapped, like it had gone back and forth through most of the game. So great game with john it was yeah. super fun and um, close games there, are always the best games and there was so much did stuff on the table by the end of it <laughs> like off the it, table i guess yeah yeah fair enough um my land raider again kind of outlasted at one point it got down to six wounds um but it's still just oh and this is the other thing i did which Look, somebody's probably going to say I cheated now, now because I thought it was a brilliant strategy at the time, and it seems like I didn't find anything that didn't s- said I couldn't do it. Uh, the land raider got into combat with a bunch of boys, and like he kind of jumped on the land raider just to kind of nullify it a little bit while I was on an objective. So now he owned the objective. I moved the land raider out of combat, out of close combat, rather than fire. I moved out of close combat. I spend a command point, which lets me. Uh, if I've fallen out of combat, now I can charge again. Mm-hmm. And then I tank shocked by using another command point to tank shock the unit. I don't see why I can't do it. I see yeah. Campbell thinking, please no, tell I, me. I, I'm, I think you're in the clear. I think you know, I am. It cost me two command points yeah, to do. Because like Age of Sigmar has a thing where it's like a unit can only be under the effect of one command point per uh, per phase right. or whatever. But 40, 40k does not have that. that. Yeah, and yeah. I, if you if got the points to burn, yeah. yeah, yeah. I did. I did a really good job this game of managing my command points. Like there were times where I was like, "This objective sucks. I'm going to ditch it at the end of my thing, take extra command point." And I used them. Like it really did make me think. Like as I got to the end of the game, and I had like a command point there, and I fail like a 12 inch charge, like just like a hail mary, mary charge. I'm like, maybe I can get rid of this guy. I'm like. Yeah, I should use a command point to reroll for a 12 inch charge. Like, I feel like if you've left a command point on the table at the end of the game, you're not playing your, your command yeah. points right. No, um, I don't want to float them. But yeah, uh, uh, backing out of the combat, then charging, tank shocking, 
And when you tank shock with a land raider, I mean, that's, you're throwing a lot of dice and, and just grinding a bunch of these boys under, under the treads and then being locked in combat and shooting the rest of them off of me, you know, with big guns never tire that, that locked down that whole, like it took out like a 20, 20 man unit, you know, over, over two rounds. So I was not too, not too disappointed wow, yeah. in that performance. But there was points where he was like swinging his claw and stuff at it. And I'm like, onesie, twosie, taking wounds on the land raider. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm down to six points. <laughs> if I lose this, please let it explode. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> but in the end, great game. Like John was a super fun opponent. We we really, really, I think, enjoyed playing each other. And uh, man, it was close. It was close. But I was super excited that I actually pulled out a victory. So, so that was me. Uh, <clears throat> all right. I think that's enough yakking about what we've been doing let's take a short break we'll come back then we'll get into the meat of the show and we'll talk about kind of the origins of 40k terrain and uh where it's gone from there so we'll be right back i I meant origins origins You know what? I live in the beautiful state of origin. (laughs) You know what? (laughs) I've drank a third of this beer. Don't hold it again. (laughs) There's four entire percent alcohol by volume in there. That's right. All right. The origins. (laughs) Uh, The early days of Warhammer 40k terrain. There it is. How about how about we go there? Yeah. Um, And so, you know, when I first learned about Warhammer 40,000. It was probably like third edition by that point. And, um, <clears throat> young and y- yeah, everybody was, was look, we didn't have a lot of money. We also probably didn't have a lot of room to get involved in creating a lot of terrain. So you, I would always see stuff like books on the table to, to, you know, do things. Maybe, maybe a green grass mat, maybe a towel thrown over the books to make them look like a hill. Um, but it was really, there, there really wasn't much spectacle to it. And one of the things about Warhammer 40,000 that I love, uh, and which is, is quite frankly, why like old world Warhammer fantasy doesn't have a lot of appeal to me is that there's terrain on a board, which we did an episode a long time ago called, uh, terrains, the third army on the board. And it, helps tell the story and the terrain has theoretically uh, a lot of impact on the way the game is played Uh, whether it's maneuvering around it or taking advantage of cover from it or using it for line of sight blocking it can have a lot of effect on the game and the thing i like about 40k is that it just feels like it's so interactive when you're playing it helps with that immersion so much too. Like the, not only the storytelling, but now now your dudes are interacting with it, and you just like really puts you you on, in boots on the ground with with your boys there. Yeah, there's a reason every codex has photos of models not standing on a clear piece clear piece of plexiglass, right? But on a beautifully modeled three dimensional yeah. table that puts them into <clears throat> context, puts them into a scene. It looks like a movie diorama, whatever you want to put there. You actually hit the word I was heading for, which is diorama. Like, yeah. if you walk up to a really good game of 40k, like to me, it lo- in my mind, it looks like a diorama. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Justin and I played a game several years ago now where I broke out like all my Forge World like city tiles and packed the board with city stuff. And like, and we were playing through this game. And at one point I said to Justin, he was complaining about the way the models stood on like one of the craters or something. And I look at him, I go, Justin, do you realize like not everybody plays this game with this level of, like we are in a very unique position <laughs> and we take it for granted that we have this amazing setup here. And he was like, yeah, this is a good point. <laughs> you know? So, uh, you know, back in the day though, like the challenge to get there, I think made the game less appealing to me there. It was super hard to, you didn't have the internet <laughs> back in my day. You, you didn't have the internet to, to look at a bunch of YouTube videos and say, how do I create Hills or how do I yeah. create? Yeah these things and it just for me it was it was just less engaging at that point 
scratch building is also its own distinct skill yeah. because like painting yeah. is a skill building models is a skill scratch building convincing terrain is a whole different skill yeah. uh, so when i started playing like even though my dad's <laughs> a historical war gamer the terrain he'd get would be the occasional like sometimes some companies would have like a resin or f- like a uh, vacuform plastic like right log cabin or we'd have like fish tank um ruins yeah or a toy castle or like mage knight had a set of wall castle walls we used but we were terrain was pretty dire when i started uh so we had to do a lot of scratch building which involved a lot of like cutting and taping and gluing cardboard or foam Mm -hmm. core when Mm -hmm. we got a little better at it we were uh gluing foam core together and like painting it with you know vinyl paint or whatever so it wouldn't eat it away and eventually we started like gluing some bits on there so you'd get like a imperial guard vehicle sprue you know get some of the accessories from there to kind of give it some context make it look a little better or use textured paint to look better than that but a lot of my early games were on a big piece of plywood painted with dark green house paint and a couple random pieces of terrain i got at cons a couple scratch built stuff and there wasn't standardization back then right there weren't really out of the box kits you could get at no the very least there weren't out of the box kits you could get for a reasonable price because we'll talk in a bit about stuff that gw made and sold but for a good amount of time there was nothing like right not just yeah bad options but like no options no options no yeah options. and yeah, and I think that in the third edition box set, and that was it. Yeah, and I yeah. think that led to a ton of creativity on people's part, though. For you know, whether it was, hey, look, if I cut up um, this broom and use you know these bristles from the broom, it looks like you know fields of wheat or whatever for this particular area for my yeah. World War II you know fields. Um, And so I think people were forced to get creative. You even saw this with vehicles early on speaking, not a train, but I mean the, the famous, you know, uh, uh, deodorant stick tank, deodorant stick tank. Right. But I mean the creativity involved to come up with those things. um, I I think in it, it, Campbell, you, you said it's a, it's a skill set for building terrain it absolutely is mel bows put out a book with published by dave taylor a while back called terrain essentials which i immediately bought and never used (laughs) like like and because not only is it a skill but you also have to have the area and and the workshop to really do that work in you know a place and for most kids yourself excluded because your father was a miniatures war gamer uh They didn't have access to, for the most part, an environment in which they could explore these types of creations, whether it was paper mache stuff or, you know, whatever. Um, You know, so a lot of games at that time were, we're going to stack a bunch of stuff under this and make it look like a hill or, you know, we'll just, these soda cans or, you know. Um, but people started progressing and I think, Hey, you know what? I remember, I remember distinctly one of the first kind of resin terrain pieces I saw was these, um, they were just like these circles that you would put on top of a beer or soda can and glue in. And then all of a sudden you've got like a silo kind of mechanical looking silo thing. And I was like, Oh, that is brilliant. I believe armor cast still sells those. Yep. Oh, Oh, do they? Yeah, I believe I'm, they do. Yeah. Um, I, I might need here, to get some. Uh, has some of those that he used to uh, <clears throat> make some industrial tank terrain. But I remember I had uh, I had armor oil cast ref- was amazing back then. Yeah, I yeah. had oil refinery uh, when I was a kid that I got at like Historicon for like ten bucks or whatever, uh, and it was a styrofoam base, two Pringles tubes. Uh, as like the big uh, cans yep. with like yep. a bendy straw connecting the two of them as like a pipeline. So yeah. Like M&M minis things like I, it was cool. Like identifying all the trash to treasure <clears throat> of that was really neat. And yeah. it is something that does go back to like the origins of this as a craft hobby up there with mo- uh, military modeling, model railroad stuff and so on, which is it, cool. It's really cool. And I feel yeah. like while we're in a much better, more accessible place, you know, it's a bummer to see some of that go by the wayside, but also you can still do all that. Yes. If you want to, you can go dumpster diving and go (laughs) hog wild. Yeah. 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 And I mean, that, that's a, a, an excellent point because, uh, as, as I feel like 
a lot of the tables with the terrain that we have today and the options we have today also kind of look a bit of the same, right? Everybody kind of has the same ruins and yada, yada. And I'll talk a little bit about some stuff we could do there. But as, as we talk about these early days of kind of terrain, so um, aside from historical gamers coming up with solutions for this stuff, for most 40K players or fantasy players, it was White Dwarf where they would show like, here's how we built this train. And in particular, I remember an article around, um, it was around, it was around middle earth, uh, miniature battles game. And they had created Moria, like the, the, uh, the, the hall of Moria that led to like the bridge of Khazad doom. Uh And, and they showed how they made it and how they made, the like cavern walls using like this spray foam that would, you know, harden once they, once they had it in place and look like rock once they painted it up. And I remember I must've read that article four or five times going at the time I was primarily a Dungeons and Dragons player going, how can I make like a cavern thing using this stuff? And God help me, it would have been a total mess, you know, because that stuff is sticky and messy when you're using it. But yeah. but the ingenuity behind that and the fact that White Dwarf showed you, like, here's how we made this thing. So that if you wanted to try to attempt something similar, you could do it. That for that for me was kind of my first like, oh, you know, look, they have it. And then I discovered games workshops, like how to build war game terrain book that they put together. Yeah. This one, that one, except <laughs> I have the, I have the next edition, which we had a blue cover. It's the same yeah. thing though. This it's all the same one, stuff. Yeah. This is the one from 96 yeah. that shows you how to make a uh, empire house out of a, yep. uh, was a, a brand flakes package. Yeah. Whatever. yeah. <laughs> Raisin brand package. Yeah. It's, it's literally the same book, I think inside, uh, as, Pretty as much. the one I have. Um, but it's an uh, issue of White Dwarf that re- has stood out in my mind for 30 years now. And I, I wish I had the the episode or issue number in front of me. But it, they took a um, Star Wars toy as a transport from Hoth and converted it into a crashed Space Hulk. So it was this plastic shell from the 70s was the Star Wars transport toy. But then they actually like went in there, cut it in half put in a bunch of corridors, put in hatchways, things like that. Wow. And like, and this is like early nineties and this is <clears throat> stood out in my mind of like, this was the precedent of what could be done. And as somebody who's been playing since second edition, where most boards were very much fantasy and historical base, like almost every game of 40 K you saw was like a, a flocked mat yeah. with some foam Hills that were flocked on top of that. And it was very like fantasy transported, it, it didn't have the grim dark battlefield effect that you see in games right. today because of what was it what was available what was accessible on on top of your green field occasionally you'd get like a styrofoam bunker or you'd get some foam core ruins like that was as kind of grim dark as it would get when you actually oh yeah got up to like scratch built foam core ruins or some kind of like foam core and styrofoam thing every and then every package toothpicks in it and <laughs> every package you received that had styrofoam in it you were like how can i turn this into a yeah, piece absolutely. of terrain the yeah. styrofoam insert around a lampshade flip it upside down that's a coliseum baby there you we're, go we're gladiator fights. <laughs> there you go so, josh uh, I, this is terrible radio uh but yeah there's the uh yes it's like yes the rebel transport sawed in half just filled and detailed full of stuff it's it's so cool yeah. like again, that, that's that nice. thing and that has just lived in my head rent free for the last 30 years because somebody had such a cool vision on how to like this classic toy that was awesome in and of itself, but then all, converting that into uh, like a yeah part of a, a space Hulk that had crashed into this planet. And, and I, again, that white dwarf article came out 30 plus years ago and it's just, it's just stuck with me for the creativity and imagination of bringing that to life. And the, uh, even uh, I'm pretty sure that, that game featured a battle report around this specific piece of terrain. Of course, because if they Turn were going to an objective, like if they were going to spend all the time to make that, they were going to do a yeah. battle report around it. Even today, they still do the same thing. And I don't blame them. Like, actually, I want to see right. that yeah. for the most yeah. part. 
Yeah, if you ask your boss for two weeks to make a cool piece of terrain, <laughs> you better find a way to make that worth your boss's time. That's right. But that right. definitely right. goes back to like White Dwarf's sort of origin as an enthusiast magazine and yes. as a hobbyist magazine more so than a catalog. And that's kind of its own <laughs> separate discussion. And I still think White Dwarf has a lot of cool stuff now. But that definitely it does, back. but it but it has lost some of some of that um, right. DIY. The DIY aspect is yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and so like. And you kind of brought this up, Campbell. You were like, oh, cardboard or styrofoam or polystyrene or, or what have you. But some of those were common materials that we were using. Cardboard, plaster, you know, over stuff. Um, Sculpey. Bal- balsa wood, Sculpey. Um, the, the, the benefit to that is like the stuff was typically readily available and cheap to use. The, the kind of drawback was it took a while to turn it into something that looked like something. Um, yeah. I think... You, you talk about skill. There's another, let me bounce back to that real quick. There's another skill that I think certain people have that I do not have, which is looking at some piece of something and then saying, well, that's a box or a, a piece of electronics or whatever. But at this scale, it looks like something entirely different. I've seen people use like computer fans. Mm-hmm in yeah. necromunda boards that it, yeah. uh, you know disguise it enough that it, like oh look it looks like a gigantic like air vent you know or like air conditioning vent or something i, I lack that like vision that some of these folks are able to just see something and then realize its potential at a different scale I mean, it's um, the same it's similar to the people who can look at a kit and be like okay i know how to make this sp- random set of whatever into necromunda weirdos because they can right. identify all the cool yeah. bits and where they would go like kit bash in your sim- head yeah it's a similar yeah. skill set being able to kit bash in your head like that yeah. well, so it was uh interesting sometimes too just with the limited materials if you if you had styrofoam and then you take something like aerosol or acetone to it it's going to melt that styrofoam you don't know the result you're going to get but that's how you could get a battle weathered bunker in there without having you know, like <laughs> hot weather knives <laughs> like good do it rain. <laughs> you're sure definitely going to create some fumes but uh yeah have a that side yeah with a respirator preferably <laughs> But yeah, like acetone and foam interact in a really interesting way. If you want, it's kind of like a natural rock formation. Like it, it's not the healthiest thing to do, but it gets really cool effects. And <laughs> but aerosol too, as aerosol melts foam, yeah, uh, you, you could concentrate your spray in order to get more. Like I want a, a big kind of divot, and like let's replicate a blast in this spot. Yeah. And now, like now, people are doing the opposite, where you're actually like carving the foam and then putting like a Mod Podge over it to lock, like protect the foam, and then yeah. painting on top of that. As, as a, a a mix of uh, real thick white glue painted over yeah. the thing would typically protect it. But it's funny that you mentioned wearing a respirator. It's funny, not funny, Campbell about the respirator. I remember um, Imperial Voxcast. Uh, mm-hmm. You know when those guys were down in Southern California. Uh, early on when I was listening to podcasts, I remember they were talking about how they were, I don't remember what they were mixing, but they were doing something. And the guy was like, yeah. And then I got like real lightheaded and I'm like, cause you're poisoning yourself. I'm like yelling at the <laughs> I mean, it was in brain cells. I have, I have been there in my, <laughs> in my first apartment alone. I was like, Oh, I've got a vent hood on my stove. I can prime on my stove. Oh no. So I put, my box oh, no. primed on there and then i realized the vent hood goes back into the kitchen it doesn't go out it goes back <laughs> into the kitchen so i'm like okay cool i'm huffing fumes tight. yeah uh later that night i go to cook and smoke is coming off of my oh god because i didn't cover my stove and i'm burning paint off my burner. burning so, paint. Yeah, oh don't yeah. be like me or don't be <laughs> like me when i was 21 at least. just be careful with this stuff <laughs> yeah talk yeah to you, you know and and josh you were talking about how the spray paint can melt this kind of stuff um which leads to another point like some of this stuff was not particularly durable either and storing terrain as we've all stick things too yeah storing terrain is super um you got to be super careful otherwise you're damaging it you have to go back and fix it i have pieces of terrain that were made of styrofoam or whatnot that have like you know, gouges in them and now the white shows through and I have to go back and fix it at some point, but instead I just use different terrain. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but it, it can be disheartening when you see something like that get damaged. Yeah. Now, Justin, we have a bunch of, um, desert terrain here that Justin made it one time and he made like way too much when he made it. And so gave me some of it and that stuff, like 
he coded the heck out of that stuff because that stuff Relaxed is even. Su- yeah. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice call back. Call back. <laughs> Uh, it, 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 but it is super durable, like just really well constructed terrain. Cause I know he just, you know, dumped glue and, and water paint, uh, you know, priming it before, before, uh, painting it. And it just, that stuff looks fantastic. He did such a good job on it. It's all, and it's all foam core, or, excuse me, uh, pink foam. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but man, they are, they're some of my favorite pieces. They look really good on the table those, too. Those stacks of like those mesas of carved insulation foam yep. from like Gorka Morka and every battle report right. in third yeah. and early. It's exactly what this stuff is. Yeah, it is. Again, it's a primal part of my brain that just like <laughs> activates every time I see them. It makes me very happy. Yeah. So then, you know, games workshop goes on for a while and they're producing, people are making their own stuff like this. One last thing thing i'll point out was another hugely inspirational white dwarf for me was they during the um 13th black crusade kind of era where they were covering that and running the worldwide campaign there was a convention that ran a battle for cadia and they had created this massive series of tables that were all together and like in this i want to say like a u-shaped form but it was it was huge. Like there, were, you had there were parts where you had to climb under the table to come up in the middle of the section. They had like this huge arch they had made, like kind of like the Arc de Triomphe in, in in Paris. And in it were little statues that they had obviously used, you know, miniatures and painted as statues. Like the creativity involved in that was like massively inspiring to me. And I was like, man, that's this is early on in in our days of forty k. And, and and as I looked at that those pictures, I was like those are the kind of games I want to play. Like I, I, I don't want to play with this mix of terrain that doesn't really match, you know, and it's, and it's kind of a hodgepodge, if you will, of, of different styles and not a thematic board. And, and that was where like, I kind of got this fire in me of uh, every time I'd go to a, uh, we would have like, um, flea markets around flea here markets, that were at sloppy. game yeah. at game stores and like our objective in going to those every time was look for terrain look for terrain <laughs> look for terrain we're not here to buy anything else just terrain just find terrain and eventually we developed a collection of it and a lot of it was stuff that had been made by other people i found a guy online on ebay that would create foam terrain for you in sets and i was like i'm buying this set and that set from him and you know, I built an overpass out of foam core and uh, PVC piping and stuff so that we could, you know, it was just, it, it, it was a very interesting time. But then Games Workshop kind of steers, re- recognizes, hey, there's, <laughs> there's some revenue to be made here if we yeah. can provide some terrain. But even before that, they start releasing like these plastic and cardboard hybrid kits. And I, I don't know if it started with Necromunda. But that's where I remember started with like Necromunda, the fifth Titanicus. Uh, t- well, Titanicus had the um, Titanicus. Didn't the first one have the foam core, like the foam ruins that were just the, the foam blocks were Titanicus. Titan legions came out and it was the first, I think card and plastic and plastic yeah. roofs on card walled and buildings. Epic space Marine had the same yeah. ones where he has this like plastic formed roof bit and yeah, cardboard body there. And I think they, I don't think they had any other terrain for Epic, like proper like that uh, for no. a minute, but they had some boxes of like essentially railroad trees like that you could get for a hot minute. They started selling the rollable mats. I think they right. started doing the foam hills and yeah, with like fifth edition fantasy and Necromunda and second edition 40 K all those like early mid nineties boxes. They started putting out these card terrain with plastic fasteners and right. for, yeah. for 40 K. I think it was just basically a, uh, couple ruins that weren't really anything special for fantasy it was like a tower that was kind of neat but for, for for necromunda you got these plastic bulkheads which had all these like gothic for the yeah. time detailing on them that you would kind of like slot all these bits into 
And the cool thing was you could build buildings, but then you could take them apart. So you could flat pack them, which destroys them because they're cardboard, but also right. means you can rearrange them into different shapes. So that at least five cool. times, at least <laughs> maybe even six. I've got, I've got an intact set from the nineties that still does oh, mostly nice. go together. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's, it was really cool. And from a hobby side, you could still paint and weather the bulkheads. Uh, I've actually got, they started doing some 40K buildings around that time. And I've got one of those still intact where I did paint and weather all the bulkheads. And I just built the Imperial Guard bunker around that or whatever. So there were a few of those ar- around, which was really cool. And even into the later 90s, like Gorka Morka had a set or two, as like a couple sets as well, like an orc fort yeah. that yeah. I think the... Right. Some of the buildings in Dawn of War were actually based on those, which is very fun. <laughs> the Gorka Marka. You it's so funny how that's... The, uh, the third edition ruins uh, out of the box set there, but that was kind of the, the real start of that that aesthetic and kit going forward for 40k ruins going mm-hmm. forward, which is obviously like exploded from now. It is funny how it's gone full circle, how people have created terrain that is based on the Dawn of War stuff <laughs> now too, to match yeah. those buildings. I've got some garage kits based on the Dawn of War stuff that are cool as hell. Yeah, they're great. Don't really use them much these days, but I I want to. I need to do some more thematic gaming with those. Uh, But yeah, the third edition ruins, like you said, Josh, were like, they were plastic. It was really cool, but it was just like two little corners of ruins that are the size (laughs) of my hands. Um, I'm a normal sized person. They're not that big. Um, (laughs) And some like jungle trees, which were really tiny, very cute and not very usable. Yeah. I I remember seeing, this is also though, we started seeing some white dwarf guides and how to make the most out of these. So they make like bases of those trees which would involve buying like four of the sets to actually get. And the cool thing was it was a combination of those scratch building techniques and the ready-made stuff. Yeah. So you'd be like scratch building this little hill uh, and then getting all these trees in there and then like texturing it and adding extra details, going back to sort of those DIY sorts of things. And it was a cool combination of the two. It was a weird middle yeah. ground before we started getting quote unquote proper plastic. Kits. Keep that in mind. Cause I'm actually going to come back to that point in, in a little bit too, because I, there's a member of our group who's done something pretty amazing that I'll, I'll talk about that. But then um, you could also get coming out early. They, it, GW released like plastic hills. Like you could, I you could piece, you could piece. They're still a great, they're still a great, they're really good. They're really pe- good. Yeah. There's still a great piece of terrain. Uh, these plastic hills you could put together or put on the edge of the board or, or, you know, however you wanted to utilize them. Super easy to paint this stuff up. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, that was, you started seeing a prevalence of those on all tables, uh, as well as like as you mentioned, there's like the plastic trees that were, that were out and available at that point. Cause everyone had them cause the <clears> trees <throat> and the ruins were in the starter set. Yeah. And I right. think even when yep. they re-released the third edition starter set, like I, for, as a made to order thing a couple of years ago, they had the trees and ruins. Oh, that's there. so I funny. I think they did. If they didn't, then they uh, was lost <laughs> wagging my finger at that. I didn't buy it anyway. <laughs> Uh, the ruins were there at least i'm not sure i don't remember the trees but the ruins definitely were nice uh, and i remember there was even like a, a white dwarf guide and how to do a multi-layer like multiple stories and it was to get the ruins and get a second set and flip it upside down and put the floor on the other side it looked janky but it was there it, was cool. <laughs> it worked and forge world actually had some resin ruins around this time too they did and uh, those were expensive <laughs> they were really expensive really heavy yeah gorgeous yeah to this yeah. day gorgeous because Again, this is old school Forge World. They made something by hand and just cast it. So yeah, you're exactly doing a, yep. a resin cast of someone's cool scratch build, uh, and that was also around Cities of Death in the late '90s, early 2000s, yep. back in the, like late third edition, which was cool because that was a rule book. Uh, no, City Fight before Cities. Of Death. City Fight. City Fight. Yeah, uh, which it was cool because it was a rule book that had like. A quarter of the book was dedicated to scratch building your own ruined city. Right. And it had this awesome, like my like aspirational thing was uh it's called like Volksgrad or something like that. It was a very much a Stalingrad inspired, like bombed out city with a big river running down the middle of it. And it was a combination of those existing Forge World GW kits with scratch building. And again, it was like it's the whole hobby on display and, and wasn't there aspirational a way. Wasn't there like a temple at one end of that as well? There probably was uh, uh 
I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm thinking I mean, of a different. There's one. Definitely a lot of like brain bleed here, but yeah, uh, you were seeing a lot of like <laughs> movement trays being used as like roofing on buildings. Oh, um, interesting. Is still yeah, and, <laughs> honestly them re-releasing the Warhammer Fantasy movement trays is like the coolest thing for scratch builders. Oh, that's interesting. Those are like tile. They're tiles essentially. They're textured. So they take dry brushing really well. So yeah. when I did a, a display board like five years ago, I used those for like the road on them, and it that's was clever. Really lovely. That's clever. Yes. So it's interesting that you brought up Cities of Death because this is where like GW goes whole hog. Um, Cities of Death comes out, which is eff- effectively a, a iteration of City Fight at that point. And this is fourth edition that it comes out and they come out in support with that of, hey, look, you can buy these ruin, these plastic ruins that you can put together kind of any way you want to. Uh, and boy, these boxes fly off the shelves. We bought, I bought at least two of them personally. I still have one sealed in my garage uh, that I inherited from Doug um, when when he passed. But um, but those things are still useful to this day. Like they're incredible. They're incredible. And they had like Mechanicus buildings. You had you know uh, regular city office building type type things. Well, forty k city office buildings. <laughs> Yeah, no intact buildings are made. Let's just no. make that clear. The right, buildings yeah. don't stay intact in the 41st millennium. Home insurance is a nightmare. Uh, the, the thing is, <laughs> it's worse than California and Florida for oh, home really? insurance. Yeah, um, those sets are great because even to this day, you can still use them if you want to do like a competitive layout, which we'll get to in a minute. Yep. Easy peasy. No problem with those. If you want to make something thematic, awesome. If you want to do the half scratch build, half GW kit, what do you know? They did that a lot. So good. Yeah. I remember. Um, in fifth edition, there was like a battle report on like a jungle planet when like the guard codex came out. They were showing off the then new Catachan command squad and all that stuff. And they had this <laughs> very cool like um, imperial facility that they built with this set and it had a removable elevator. So they had guys like going up and down this, the floors because the sets were so modular and mutable. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. They, yeah. I think those are still. Even if there's like, still some of the best kits, they ever the best kits they've ever made. Even yeah. If like and the it, details are sharper on the new ones. Those you could make, I, I remember seeing, you know, <laughs> there were crenellations along the top that are always super spiky. So, of course, you're going to rip your <laughs> arm open on those things. Oh, yeah. Like, how many times did you get a scratch all the way down your arm as a result of one of those things? We stopped putting them on. But I did see people create, like, walkways using those and then cutting the, um, you know, like the the floor or, or floor tiles so that you could just have, like, these walkways between buildings as well. Um I mean, just they're in, infinitely changeable. Mm-hmm. It's just infinitely changeable stuff. It's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And I and think that was like a huge seller for a games workshop. I think so, because if every, like I couldn't afford them at the time because I was a teenager. And if I had like 40 bucks of, you know, allowance money or whatever, I wasn't going to blow it on terrain. I was going to blow it on Terminators. Of course. Yeah, but yeah, though, I feel like every game club had a, a yeah. like good stock of those. Every store, every person with like a home gaming setup probably had a couple dozen of those i even built one like four years ago and had a great time with it like that that is still a very good set i've actually kept that set that that i got from doug uh specifically for not building additional ruins but building like specific things between ruins or you know or or whatever i want to use it for yeah but not i don't need yeah i don't need more you know, two walled or three walled ruins. I need things that connect those things together. So Thematic scattered, uh, tie it all together. The rug that ties the room together. Right. Uh, those kits were kind of a, a cool combination of it. It's an official kit. It can be built in a very specific way, but it's also so modular. It has so many options within it that it allows you to uh, bring that DIY energy to it and kind of mix that with other kits, other things, or just build it and totally, it's like playing with Legos, right? Yeah. And you can Lego, just yeah. kind of do what it, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> and, and Campbell, you were mentioning, you know, the DIY in combination with things. And this is, there's two points I want to, two places I want to bring this up. And this is one of them. Uh, Anthony, who was one of the owners of Endgame up in Oakland here, uh, I watched him build various terrain. He had built some built some great pieces that combined not only uh, foam, um, you know, but then pieces of the cities of death or of the planet strike terrain, where they had you know the yeah. the uh, the towers, um, the bastions that yeah. you 
that you could build. Um, and I saw him build like this great piece utilizing those. It had multiple layers and it used like the sky shield landing pad as like a, a landing area. And so you had yeah. this really interesting piece on the table that was very usable as well. Um, so yeah, I was a huge fan of that. A huge fan of that. I would um, say first time scratch builders and eager teenagers getting into this hobby don't always build for usability. No. Uh, you build because yeah, you have right. a cool idea and then you go, ah, oh, crap, how do I fit stuff on this? Oh, models don't actually balance anywhere. <laughs> yeah, especially with old partially metal hybrid models yes. that just want to oh, tumble off those worst. gantries. <laughs> yeah, my yeah. poor heavy bolter marine. I know. <laughs> yeah. And I think the the introduction of these types of kits, as well as a couple others I'd mentioned there, like the Sky Shield landing pad, the I remember seeing these guys at Adepticon built like a massive wall out of the uh the bastions. the towers. The bastions, yeah. right? They used like one end of the bastion and just like put them all together. And it was this huge wall. And I thought, what a a brilliant idea we've seen this terrain all used if you've been to warhammer world and you've now gone into like their big display like you see you see it used to the extreme like you said oh every building's damaged like you actually see full buildings <laughs> made out of some of this stuff now it's easy to do that when all you have to do is go back to the shop and just take a bunch more <laughs> you know of this specific sprue and then cut it up and put it together but but it's just so versatile it's almost it's almost lego versatile in 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 its capacity I, I feel very much like that was one of the sort of like intense uh so if we just kind of like push forward a few years later when they've kind of like remade and made new ruins and all that stuff in eighth edition they made a bunch of 40k ruins mm -hmm. uh that you can't buy anymore mm, love that but uh they were hyper modular and there were even some uh, warcom articles with the designer which i cannot remember his name right now uh but he went over how you could like like why all these pegs were there in various places, the ways you could modularize it, the ways you could combine it with other kits, like the, like the pipes, terrain. yeah, the pipes, the necromunda yeah. terrain and so on. Yeah. And all this stuff that wouldn't fit in just like in the, in the box instruction manual, but it was very clearly the, the intent was to make something as modular and easy to use out of the box as possible. And I'll say for me, the problem was I got intimidated because I'm like, this is, there's too much I can do. The horizon is too, is too wide. Give me something simple. My brain is too smooth to comprehend this. You know what? I have the same exact problem, Campbell. Like when I see that, I'm like, uh, you know, I'm just going to build what the instructions show. <laughs> exactly. It's like, you get the Lego kit. You can build the X wing out of it. Or if you've got, you know, the brain for it, you can build, yeah. uh, you build your gr grim, dark dream house out of it. That's right. <laughs> The Sector Imperialis stuff, the way that they've thought about just like the height stacks of things and how that connects in with the Necromunda terrain, like the Necromunda walls for their their kind of zone Imperialis, Necromunda walls, um, with the Sector Mechanicus stuff, the Sector Imperialis stuff, like it's all built to be completely modular and compatible now. Like as they've put out these kits, like even, even going back and looking at kits that got put out, you know, over a decade ago, they they had this kind of mindset now of how let's let's build upon this so that things hit especially on the levels like they were really smart about how the levels stack up yeah. so you can combine all these different kits and everything's going to hit at kind of an even level if you want to have like gantryways walkways whatever you can you can add more verticality and using just a whole mix of kits out there mm -hmm. which I've seen especially in the Necromunda side of things done to some really really unique and interesting effect so as all of this is happening right now you get third party third parties involved i call it the third party revolution uh you had like battlefield in a box mm -hmm. that you could buy those were fantastic kits I, j we just played on some last night they still um make them. yeah 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 there's no, and, they're still making new ones they made battle tech ones now like they're they're just going which <laughs> and they're solid and they yeah. and they're they're and they're a reasonable price for what you're paying too like i feel it's it's not exorbitant and this is also where MDF terrain starts making like a peak. Like people realize because the access to the machines to be able to cut this kind of terrain becomes very, very easy to get for, you know, several hundred dollars. You can buy a machine that can cut this stuff with a laser. Um, so all of a sudden MDF terrain starts making like this huge splash. I will tell you my experience with MDF terrain. Some has been terrible and some has been good. 
Mm-hmm. Um, there really is an art to making sure the pieces fit together correctly and work right. Um, but one set I bought in particular kind of turned me off to it. Josh, and you'll uh, probably know this. There was like this Aldari or Eldar styled yeah. <laughs> like platforms with these swooping things. And the thing that got me excited about it was I saw Brian Harvey from our group um, had taken that and then, like you said earlier, combined it with, uh, you know, foam uh, rocks and 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 such. And so now it sits on this. It's it's gorgeous. What he did was absolutely gorgeous. And then he's a super talented airbrusher, so he airbrushed the 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 um, platforms and stuff. And it's just one of the coolest pieces I've ever seen. Uh, he brought it over to our house, my house, one time when we had a game day and we played on it. And I just thought this is stunning. So I bought that piece of terrain nightmare to assemble <laughs> like absolute working with mdf wood is just in my mind messy and 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 a pain in the in the in the butt now i have there there was a series of buildings that have come out and there's still I, there's probably companies that do it but this company is no longer around that made wild west terrain because we used to play the wild west um tom and i primarily had played the western uh, game the gw game um, and you could buy this terrain and it's already pre-colored and printed. So once it's assembled, it's like, it's, it's done. Like it looks like a really cool Western town. Um, those were a bit easier to work with for some reason than some of these kits. Have you guys worked with these at all? Yeah. It's definitely something that's evolved a lot over the last 15 years. Yeah. Because I feel like when they started, I still feel they do kind of all feel a bit to me like paintball arenas. Yeah, like they tend yes. to be pretty flat. Oh, that's, that's a, a great way to put really, it. Really? Yeah. yeah. Even if you like s- the better ones tend to have some sort of layering. Like if I recall TT Combat had some color like color like pre-colored ones where that's have, like a thin layer that looks like uh, stucco and then a layer behind it looks like brick. And yes. I'm seeing those at salute again uh, when we hung out 12 years ago or whatever. Um and those are really cool. And like Banjua, which I did a review for of their terrain for Goonhammer pretty recently. Uh, they do the pre-colored stuff as well with like stained glass windows, which is neat. Oh, that's awesome. It's a really cool yeah, detail. Yeah. Uh, but it all feels either like like MDF terrain to me as a whole feels it's so flat. Like, yeah, yeah, it's flat. It looks like a PlayStation one like. Oh, interesting. Yeah, model. fair enough. It's low. It's a low poly model compared to the high so, poly. It's so low res. <laughs> yeah, yeah, genuinely, it is. Yeah. It is lower resolution. It's less. But I've seen like companies it. do some pretty clever stuff, like oh, yeah. able to add curves to it and this kind of thing. I, I think it's limited by not being able to have like all, all the surface is going to be like extruded flat out. So that is true. It's like yeah. a very flat thing. But I feel that it's a great canvas if you mm-hmm. are like a detailer like really into the terrain side of things, like going back to the DIY side of stuff, you can make that MDF terrain look more three-dimensional and use that as sort of like the skeleton to bounce off of. And there are some structures that's better suited to. So like Agreed. people do like uh, New York brownstones for Marvel Crisis Protocol or whatever. Those work pretty well. The Western towns you, ex- you were talking about, those work great. Uh, so it's some, kind of a matter of like, the material is better for some things than others, but where it really does kind of shine is that it's more affordable and it's easy to build out of the box. Yeah, yeah that is true. When it's pretty colored. So like I heard someone, uh, I did the, the review of that Banjo terrain set or whatever, and someone was complaining like, eh, it doesn't look, doesn't look as good as like a fully painted table of like GW terrain. And I'm like, yeah, but I got this box for a hundred some bucks and in an hour and change, I've got a full set of terrain. Like as opposed I've, to 500 600 dollars of games workshop it's terrain god knows yeah. how many hours of painting yeah. and hobby yeah. and all stuff so it's like yeah. it's it's a compromise you know what yeah that's what a, is what is your time worth to you that's i think that's a great point i mean it's all and and time and burn. how much how much reward are you getting for the effort that you're putting in you know i have recently stumbled across a youtube channel that was showing like a uh, lighting effects that they can put on buildings and, and in models, you know, and there's several companies that do this, but this one had like kind of an interesting controller board where you could have like the light, like flicker. So it looks like it's, you know, kind of having power issues and that kind of stuff. And, and they were showing it on some games workshop terrain. And I was like, oh, that looks really cool. Do I really need to, you know, it, it, am, what value am I going to get out of this on my, t- I mean, without a doubt, somebody would walk up to a whole cities of death 
board and like see like a bunch of lights and they'd be like, this is really cool. And then like half an hour later, you're like, okay, can we turn the light off? <laughs> yeah. Like I'm getting a headache or, you know, or, yeah. you know, John Fearhelm going back to him, like he had oh, lit up yeah. all his, all his ultramarine bikes and everything like, had a fiber optic LED. Like, <laughs> and it was across the table from you shining right in your eyes. You're like, Jesus Christ, I can't see anything. Can you turn the high beams off, bud? <laughs> <laughs> This is halogen bulbs, man. Yeah, it is. yeah, yeah, yeah. But so it's all about, yeah, how much, what is your time worth and, and versus what are the results you get? I mean, the ideal situation is you get the best results for the least amount of effort. Right. Right. And then, and then if you want to go beyond that, then you're starting talking more about modeling for, for realism and and that kind of thing. And I think there's a degree, we've talked about this in the past where, you don't want the terrain to take over the table in terms of you want the armies to be the main characters on the table. The terrain should be an appropriate backdrop to that. You can over detail, I think, terrain sometimes. I mean, my buddy Dylan is uh, he's 40K ham slam on Instagram. Uh, that Dylan, please, please go check his stuff out if you haven't. <laughs> it is genuinely like inspirational terrain and it does occasionally require four steps to play on. I'm not yeah. joking. There's a picture of my friends like getting <laughs> his like Delac sniper out with a pair of forceps because there's no way to reach. Oh his my tra- god! But terrain is like his thing. His thing. Like terrain yeah. is more his yeah. hobby, and making this like the visions of the underhive is his thing. Like he paints model, he paints imagery, he paints characters. He's great at that too. But terrain is definitely like his hobby. So I think Necromon is definitely the place to take it to that level. Genuinely, also. yes, yeah. yeah That's exactly. on Instagram. So, Forty yeah. K ham slam at forty K ham slam uh four zero K H A M S L A M. He really Got it. does some stuff for Goon number two. Okay, I'll include a link in the show notes too. Please do. Um, yeah. But yeah, like terrain is his thing. So for him, a set of MDF terrain, like a set of pre-printed MDF terrain. No, you you're selling to the wrong audience there. <laughs> yeah. But for someone, like, get this out of here. I yeah, see him throwing like, it out the window. <laughs> precise. Honestly, he's like, yeah, this is this is kindling. Uh, but yeah. for someone <laughs> yeah. who is maybe, I'm going to use this to build the fire that I'm going to melt these plastic pieces with. <laughs> and I can burn to my head yeah. for me with. And I'm going to huff the fumes. I'm going to huff the fumes. That inspiration to create my next project. And uh, speaking but, of huffing fumes, let's take a short break, and uh, we're going to come back. I want to continue this and we'll talk about 3d printing and how the effect that has had on this so we'll be right back all right and we're back and uh we've been talking about kind of where things were i also want to talk about a little bit about where things are going and and where they are right now, which is uh, kind of the 3D printing boom. Um, Josh uh, has borrowed my PLA printer for quite some time now. How's that been working out for you, Josh? What have you been printing? It's been pretty great. Uh, I've been printing a ton of terrain. (laughs) What? That's weird. That's weird. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, no, it's been fantastic. And especially with the... uh, Getting getting the bug to to jump back into Middle Earth strategy battle games again, like just printing up some some ruins that are very specific to that game and play completely differently than how, how what you would need for Warhammer Fantasy Battles, Old World, AOS, 40K, etc. A different aesthetic, but uh, that that is a larger scale skirmish game. So each model is really independent. You don't have coherency or anything like that. So getting terrain that lets you truly interact with that on a model by model basis really helps bring that that game to life <laughs> yes yeah. he's starting um yeah so um yeah i've been printing up just a variety of things for that and then also <laughs> have used it to print up a bunch of uh bases yeah that are thematic bases uh that these will actually let me transfer between uh, aos and the old world for my vampire nice I have printed up from, I think printed scenery is the one I pointed you to Josh. Yeah. Uh, Boy, those guys have some cool kits, have some amazing kits. And I have printed up my my original go-to was I am going to print out a D and D town. Like I want to be able to set up a town on my, on my table. And so I found some, they have some great buildings, great fantasy stuff. They have sci-fi stuff as well. But, um, I was printing these and these prints take 
a long time. Like, a, like a day each, and a half for some of the each level of a building. Yeah. And so yeah. including the roof is the third level. Each level was probably like a 22 to 27 hour print. Yeah. But here's the thing, like PLA printer, really safe. Um, fume, there's not really fumes coming off of it that you need to worry about. Unlike a resin printer, I would run it here in my room constantly. Like it would just be running printing, you know, Oh, Hey, I'd come out in the morning. Oh, it's, it's done. Okay. And I'll pop that up, start the next one, you know, and it would just keep What's going. Next? Yeah. Yeah. And so in, you know, a few weeks I had amazing looking fantasy buildings in place. I've printed up some, some 40 K terrain for this stuff using a PLA printer. I haven't now the PLA printer does have some limitations. I think in terms of, um, you get some kind of striation marks and, and stuff on the levels, but the really clever designers kind of hide that stuff really well so yeah, that it can ironing on in your printer also too, especially top layers. It'll smooth so much of that out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it does add a little bit of extra time to your, your print time. Like it might add an extra hour plus, but uh, worth it, but it definitely cleans it up for those top layers where you're really seeing that surface detail. Yeah. So, Initially, when 3D printing kind of hits the scene, I remember Jeff was talking about this back in the day. Oh, it's it's going to change everything. Yeah, it is. Some of it's not quite there yet. Yeah, I would even argue today, like I, there are people that are printing stuff and it's fine, but I do find resin printed models to be a little more brittle. They tend to break a little bit more. They're starting to get really good on the quality. Um, but in particular for terrain, like, I think it's been there a while. And my concern about getting into 3D printing initially was I don't need another hobby. Like, I don't need something that I have to learn a bunch of stuff about and fiddle with and get it to work. And then somebody pointed me to the Prusa printer. And that thing's just, a, it's a workhorse. Like, it just, it just, there's no balancing of this. It does it all yeah. for you. It's done. And you just say, okay, I'm going to load this and I'm going to print. And it just I think prints. I had one fail in the six months I've been borrowing it from you. I mean, like, you do have occasional, <laughs> yeah, you can have an occasional fail, but there's things you can do to prevent that. And, and, and I mean, but in general, like I have well earned back the money I paid for that printer. Like yeah, I have yeah. so much terrain from it that has been usable to the point where we were printing like just barrels, you know, groups of barrels and little yeah, walls to full buildings. Terrain. Perfect yeah. for that. Yeah. Everything in between. You know, some of these STL files, which are what are used to map your print out, um, some are free, some, you know, the better ones you pay a little bit of money for. But if you're paying $15 for an STL file and then you can print as many as of, of them as you want. And I mean, it's going to take up, you know, probably a building like that will take up 10 to $15 of, of you know, extruder uh, printing material for it you're still like, so now you're paying effectively, the more you print it, the the less you've paid, you know, for the, for the plans. And yeah. it's been incredibly uh, beneficial. I've created Tau terrain. I've created Eldar terrain and primarily, you know, fantasy terrain at this point. I think but, it's really great for filling in those gaps. Yeah. But what I think is interesting is that some games like, non-gw games lean into it hard like yes. all of uh modifius's games they do like elder scrolls and fallout and a couple others they just sell terrain stls yeah so, like they don't have the capacity to maybe make resin yeah. kits of yeah. all these like random fallout vaults and so on but you can just download the file and just print your whole vault yourself and yeah. buy all the accessories that way and get all the doll housing in you want that way. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's a really cool solution, especially for smaller games and smaller companies. Yeah. yeah. Maybe don't have GW's manufacturing capacity to put out thousands of plastic kits. GW doesn't have GW's manufacturing capacity <laughs> at this point. <laughs> I've got a, another note on GW's plastic kits. Uh, I want to kind of touch on before we go, but we can keep talking about 3d printing for a bit first. Yeah, no, I, I think, um, Small is it going to be that some of them are printed in China? <laughs> uh, it's, yeah. it's that they so, some are some some, some were some were uh, terrain some, especially was yeah. yeah the terrain GW's modern terrain tends to be very chunky, uh, but also they do like one run and it's gone forever. And all of their yeah. competitive layouts use a very specific set of um, their pre-made ruins, right? Which are the uh, they were the like 
two piece, like two walls, one floor, like yeah. very easy to put together ruins. I got a couple from like Imperium magazine. They're great. They look great. They paint quick. They build quick and they don't freaking sell them. And yeah. it kills me that they don't just make a set with enough of those for a table and some footprints and just sell yeah. that as like a tournament practice kit. I wish they did that. I'm getting way ahead of myself, but I'm just <laughs> a little mad about this. <laughs> That's okay. Stepping back a second, just so you know, uh, table war does sell uh, footprints that are the the matte uh, yes. style footprints. Those work pretty good too, and they look better than clear plastic, in my opinion. They, but, they do. Yeah, they do. I? <laughs> I've got the, the banjo ones also have little mats, and I like them a lot better than a cr- uh, the plexiglass that's flying yeah. all over the table. Yeah. Too. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the other problem with it. Um, so, but but back to the three D printing. Um, you know, and now kind of, Josh, you know, I. I'm still like, oh, I'd really like to do uh, Mordheim, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, I could print out a Mordheim board. I mean, it's going to take me quite a while to do, but the ruins that, especially that um, uh, printable scenery has, like they're almost designed the, for it. The stone bridges and the, like the scaffolding and the, um, it's essentially like the wood plank bridges that they make yeah. to just in between. It's like, Oh, that, that is perfect for more time. Like I would love to, to bring a table of that to life. The funny thing is the 3d printed Mordheim stuff looks more like the artwork than any of the official. Mordheim right. Yeah. Like, yeah. I concur. Back in the day, yeah. which is I concur. Really cool. Like I, again, going back to like the thematic stuff with terrain, but it's, it's very cool. Yeah. So, I mean, my point there is I, I feel strongly because the 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 machinery around a 3d printer pla 3d printer is so dependable that this has solved you know there is no more going to uh the 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 flea market at the game store and going whatever it is fine terrain now it's just an internet search away a purchase of 15 20 bucks and i'm going to print this piece of terrain you know uh and we'll have it up and running for our, for our next game um and, and it really has uh josh alluded to in um adeptus titanicus earlier like we have printed we have oh, tons yeah, of yeah. scaled yeah. adeptus titanicus terrain we have printed because Quite frankly, you couldn't buy the Adeptus Titanicus terrain. It had sold all out, and we were like, well, let's do this for another solution. Now it's available, and we're like, we don't really need it any longer. Yeah, we have I mean, what I'm we need. Easily two boards worth of 8 millimeter scaled buildings, trees, things like that that I put together. And um, yeah, 3D printing has definitely saved that. I was actually just, just thinking earlier today, I've got the ruins kit that they put out for legions imperialis that i actually really need and want to assemble for that uh because that was the only like the the only hole that i found in the eight millimeter kind of stl printable community was for uh even less intact buildings like they have complete buildings they have ruined buildings uh, and various degrees of ruined buildings but these ones are like truly last legs <laughs> ruined buildings uh which for legions of perils especially definitely adds a really important element to gameplay um so i do have the <clears> kit <throat> for that that i need to build but everything else i've been able to 3d print and been very happy with uh the results i've been able to get i would say that there are a few challenges around it one you need to buy a 3d printer um and you need to take the time to just learn how it works it's it's honestly not that complicated and Guess what? Take There's advantage YouTube. of a Black Friday sale right now. I just did. I got myself a 3D printer, which is why I can finally oh, get did you? his back. <laughs> yeah, nice. yeah. Which one did you get, Josh? Uh, I went with the Bamboo Lab uh, P1P, which was $250 off for Black Friday nice. and has been incredible. I've had it going the last couple days nonstop. And that's what I was like. Oh, can I give you? Did you want your printer back last night? Yes, I want my printer back. Yeah. <laughs> next, time, next time I see it, we won't do a shady uh, parking lot handoff. But yeah, I'll give <laughs> yeah. Idea. No, I, I, you know, I found the Prusa to be a really great deal um, and it works super well and it's super easy and it's actually the latest versions are so much better than the one I have too. Um, But you do need to invest the initial money in it. I, if you are somebody that needs a lot of terrain or is making a lot of terrain, I think you will get your money's worth out of, out of this purchase. Um, Every gaming club benefits from having a 3d print person. Yeah, uh, for sure. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
there is, uh, you know, you need to invest a little bit of time getting getting that to work, and it does take a little while to for a print to run. But again, like these are kind of fire and forget things. Like you just let it run. You eventually you come out. You're like, <laughs> what used to happen to me is I got so used to the noise of the printer going. What would happen is all of a sudden I'd be. It's really quiet. What? It's oh, quiet. it's done. It's, it's yeah, been it's done for an hour. It's your <laughs> yeah. white noise machine. It's how you go to sleep. Yeah. It, it became almost that, like a Pavlovian kind of it's <laughs> response to it. White noise and terrain. What, what That's more right. can you ask for? That's right. You can find, you know, varieties of file quality. Some people present better ones. Some people not so much. Um, I wish I had... The thing it does make me do, Josh, is make me wish I had 3D modeling expertise because, yeah. you know, you, you look at these STLs and you're like, oh, man, this is amazing. I wish I could make something like this or design something like this on my own. I do not have those skills. To learn those skills is 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 a I, significant time sink. So before, again, the uh, Civitas Ruins kit came out, I, I actually took the STLs of some of the Titanicus buildings that I had printed out and took those into just Tinkercad at the time, which is a free web-based version mm-hmm. of you know 3D modeling, and actually cut up those buildings to make ruined versions of that. So when the buildings blow up in the game, I can replace it with a, uh, an actually a destroyed, blown up version of that. And I'm like, super happy with that. But this is going to be a slight tangent and I won't go much into it. But uh, with resin printing uh, for models, tokens, things like that, I've definitely been playing with Blender a bit more in order to actually start combining things and creating things, uh, mm. which is useful for me as a you know a video professional like Blender. You can do some amazing <coughs> just like 3D rendering animation stuff with. But on the plus side, I can also use it for nerd hobbies of like combining tokens, making tokens, um, things like that, which, is, which has been great. But it definitely is... Add it, it's really reinforcing that 3D printing is an additional hobby to the hobby. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. When, and, you, when and the, you are going deeper in that. Yeah. And the reason I've been so focused on, yeah. yeah. And the reason I've been so focused on PLA printers in this segment is because you don't really need a resin printer to print terrain. A resin printer will print, will print some great terrain and it will probably be even more detailed than a. PLA printer will get you with fewer kind of imperfections, but the reality is like this is going to meet your your needs. I'm, yeah, it's going to meet ninety five percent of your needs for terrain printing. Um, you can't print very well miniatures on a PLA printer, but you can print terrain, and it's just such a great workhorse for that. So couldn't. Couldn't pitch it enough in my mind. And I think this is where kind of the future is going to go for terrain building and stuff. I think we're going to, you know, man, if, if somebody makes an easy way to like, you have these components and then there's a software to just combine the components, components like Lego, and then you have an SDL print, that's going to be worth, it's going to be worth some money. That's going to be worth some money. I would purchase something like that. Yeah. So, speaking of the future, you know, I mean the future of where Warhammer 40 K terrain goes, I think it's just a matter of time till somebody does put something that is simple to combine pieces together. And then it exports to an STL that you can then print. I mean, think um, about something like a hero forge that like yep. re- that, that 3d app base, it's a web-based app where you can design your D and D character just from a list of, you know, the list of like components and add-ons and so on. And you yeah. can get a print or get just the STL I can imagine someone doing something very similar for yeah. terrain in the future. Or they'll make a killing. They'll yeah, make a they killing. <laughs> they'll make a killing. You know, you could design this thing and then sell you the STL, or we'll print it for you and ship it to you, just like Hero Forge does. Which I have bought a couple Hero Forge Same. Uh, models specifically for D and D games that that we've played, and it's been it's been perfect. It's been awesome. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, what do you guys think? kind of comes next really i think we're at a weird place because gw doesn't sell terrain for long you mm-hmm. get like a splash yeah. kit yeah you can buy it for a little bit and then it's gone for a while and sometimes it comes back sometimes <laughs> it doesn't. and sometimes it's like faction terrain like the imperial guard aegis defense line which they've got available 
but who knows for how long because like the sisters terrain kit that came out with them the basilic Anim or whatever they stopped selling that which sucks because it's beautiful but you can't take it anymore yeah and i think i got one i'll sell you 300 <laughs> <laughs> that's what they're selling for on ebay Criminy. 250 to 300 bucks yeah it's it's not worth it <laughs> no no it's just but- it's a great statue with yeah. a little tur- you know, temple around it. Right. Just, I'll, I'll trade the statue for a prey Nexus deck of cards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I feel like have it like I feel like with how much 40k is codified at this point. Because like yeah. if you look at competitive 40k, which is not necessarily the main way people play, but the main style of play that the game is kind of built around at this point. Yeah. Because even if you don't play, you know, in tournaments with hardcore lists, a lot of people are still playing with the GW layouts or GW missions or whatever. And you uh, still benefit from rules that and you, yeah, you yeah. Do. yeah. And I think that that is such a I think that's great for the game. I think that's amazing Agreed. For the game. And the terrain being so like defined and I'll be honest, two dimensional is very good for the game. Yes. Is it good for the experience, the aesthetic? I don't believe so. Yeah. There are ways to make it much prettier. Like you can have modeled uh, footprints. You can have or, or like printed ones with like designs like the ones from Table War. You can have nice terrain that isn't just, you know, MDF staples essentially. Right. Uh, but you can largely play competitive 40K on a two dimensional map like it's War Machine right now, which right. I, I like from a cleanliness perspective. I don't like from a, immersion immersion yeah. perspective yeah. it's i like Completely it a lot to agree. play but it's not why i fell in love with the game <laughs> this is and this goes you know that's such a great you know again callback though but in a serious way to my points kind of at the beginning of the segment which was that was what got me into this in the first place mm. the difference at the tacoma open i talk about this in the bonus episode josh and i released on our patreon yeah. <laughs> at the independent characters.com um <clears throat> the um I, I talk about the difference between the, the 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 competitive scene there and then the narrative scene, and it was just like the tables just looked for a minute. Like mm-hmm. when I went to the narrative area, it's like, oh, this is where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> like I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that's where the tough guys are, and I'm over here. This and, is the balance first room, and this is the let's tell a story room. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, pretty much, it's pretty perfect. much. Which makes sense from match play. And by the way, they must right. have had 20 of those sisters basilica kits yeah. <laughs> on those tables. I was like, holy smokes. Yeah. So it was it was gorgeous. Like they set it up amazing. And it was amazing. Again, the versatility they got out of these kits. Yeah. Some of the theme, yeah. some of them looked so different from others. You know, it was really, really well done. Yeah. So but so going going back to your point. Yeah. But I think like there's almost kind of a admission to that sort of two dimensionality of things because you actually just added this to the uh, show notes but the most recent like kill team like not the big sexy hive storm box but the smaller one with like the uh space marine plague marines in there Mm -hmm. has mdf terrain and it is very simple pre-colored uh, is flat. it i didn't know this yeah it's pre-colored yeah. flat mdf terrain and oh. in a way it kind of feels like the second edition box set terrain again right uh <laughs> in a kind of cute way i think um we have kind of come back around to being two-dimensional and i think that's great for an accessibility portability cost perspective because yeah it's sure cheaper than you know <clears> the <throat> big kill team boxes before it um you know still gw so it's not the cheapest out there but right it's still cheaper and i think that is really cool uh, but I don't know. I feel especially in skirmish games, I want my terrain to be dense. Yeah, I want yeah. it to be exciting. I want it to be yeah. three dimensional. I'm with you. Much, uh, much less so. I think it's good they have levels of approachability now. Like mm-hmm. if you just want balance play, you just want to get on the table. You're a young kid. You're somebody who doesn't have as much disposable income. You're new to the hobby, and the models are the more exciting thing. To your point, when you were a kid, Campbell, like you had forty bucks burning a hole in your pocket. You're going to buy Terminators. You're not going to buy terrain. The fact that now you have easy access to that, like I, I'm, I'm grateful that that's an option for those people. Mm-hmm. I don't think any of us are those people that 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 are being no. targeted. Like. It, it's not no, I think it's smart. I wish it was. Game, I wish it was there when I could. When that was my situation. But I right? get why they have it, and like <laughs> adding that accessibility to again new players, younger players, people who just want to play uh, play the game and uh, don't care about the immersion as much as I think we do. Yeah. Um, like I, I, I see that and appreciate it. It's not for me, but I, it's still I think a, a cool thing that they have. <laughs> Well, and Campbell, the reason I added the kill team note there while we were recording was it, it thinking back to when I went to the preview for kill team at Nova, um, the, the terrain there is seasonal too. Like 
if you're running kill team events, like it's like, oh, well, this season, this is the terrain we're using for these events, and here's the setups. And then next season, here's the whole new set of terrain that we're using, and here's the setups. And that, that if you're an event organizer wanting to run those games workshop, what do they call them? Classified events, I think. Like that's going to become, I think, a sticking point. So they're going to have to make sure that they're able to produce that stuff in the numbers that they need to, that the tournament organizers can get a hold of it. Well, and yeah. then they have to build it and paint it, you know? Yeah. Well, the uh, War Cry was also like that, where you had specific terrain layouts in your, like, your deck of cards for your mission. It was this terrain layout, this, this terrain mm. is built this way, very specific, which I think is very good from a game balance perspective, being able to say these specific pieces of terrain are on the board. You can design around that. You can design a mission around that instead of it being much more freewheeling like it's been for most of our time in this hobby. Boarding actions does the same thing. Yeah, yeah. same exact thing. Does that draw it? Cl- there's there's already so many variables in the game that being able to at least balance one thing, balance the battlefield that you're on is one less variable given that like, whatever we got 20, 20 plus armies at this point. Mm-hmm. As I brought that up, one of the things I thought was, does this shift it closer to a board game? But I will tell you, like in my experience, it hasn't felt like that. Like when I've yeah. played it. I mean, I, I get the, I hear the occasional like pithy half informed. Oh, they're trying to make Warhammer esports, which is meaningless. Like it's meaningless. It's too boring to watch to be sports. <laughs> it's, it's, genuinely, um, it's too boring to watch. It's too boring to watch to even be esports, but it's, <laughs> I get them going for it from a balanced perspective. And sure. I like that. I like the game being more yeah. balanced from that perspective. And if you want to do your wackadoo, like we're going to do Verdun or Omaha beach or Rourke's drift or whatever, you can still totally do that. You can make your asymmetrical layouts. You can make your vertical layouts. There are rules for all those things in the game. The plunging fire rule never once used that. In I've a, used it once. <laughs> I've never used it. I've used it once. In match play tables and no terrain is higher. Than it's high enough. Inches. Yeah. 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 But it's there if you want it. Like, I think the thing is the dominant way 40K is presented is not the only way to play it. And it never has been. Right. Um, right. So, right. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll be curious, you know, um, where things go from here. I think modularity, if that's the word, mm-hmm. is always key to a successful kit for these guys. Um I don't know what Games Workshop does. I mean, going forward, like I think, I think they're getting their, I think they're getting their lunch eaten by by, three D print capabilities. And I think five years from now, honestly, it's just gonna they they may they may drop entirely out of the terrain building, packaging, molding, logistics on that compared to three D printing. Like from a business standpoint, you're talking about smaller companies like Modifius just putting out STLs. Like from a business standpoint, I think that makes so much more sense anyway. And I will, uh, and again, I don't run a multinational business, but I I will yeah. guarantee they are watching these other companies oh, and yeah. saying, oh, let's let's let them test, you know, and see how that goes. In Formula One, you have two members of your team and you have usually a dominant driver and a secondary driver and and usually you'll say like oh it's raining real hard let's bring in the secondary driver and put him on slick tires and see if it's if the rain is lit <laughs> lightened up enough before we put our you know number one driver on these things like they'll you know just like that i think games workshop is watching what the rest of the market is doing seeing what they're doing it would <clears throat> i don't know maybe i'm giving too much credit but it would surprise me if they were not looking forward five years and saying, okay, what is our strategy to deal with 3D printing in both a terrain capacity as well as a miniatures capacity? Because I think realistically, as much as I hate to say it, like I think that their model of business is going to have to change. They are not going to be able to just produce plastic miniatures that we buy 10 years from now. I, I think 10 years from now, the 3D printing capability will be so easy to use and so prevalent that it will kind of, they're, they're going to see a major, major hit, you know? I mean, can't predict the future, no. obviously. GW is a slow boat to turn, and they're never, yeah. they're rarely the first to do anything. Uh, they'll often do it later 
maybe better. But better. But yeah. they're never but they're rarely the first to do something. Agreed. Yeah. I yeah. honestly see um so Snot Goblin put out a set of modular ruins pretty recently. Yeah. Uh, which is like a plastic modular ruin set that you can put together to do all sorts of stuff. And then take apart, supposedly, right? Right. And yeah. you can. Um it can start getting fiddly, but it is very Lego esque. And I could see GW doing something fairly similar to that just for yeah. like Again, the tournament layout type stuff. Uh, I could see them doing something like that. I don't see them selling STLs, but I don't either. I don't either. You never know. Um, But I don't know what they do because, again, you know, I'll I'll scare how much they care. Like they might be like, oh, yeah, we're getting our lunch eaten on terrain, but that's not our focus. (laughs) Terrain, I doubt, is their focus. Yeah. Yeah. You know, taking the next leap, it's like, well, what are they going to do? broadly speaking about the game in general and i don't have an answer there but i do think i do think they eventually kind of pull back from the terrain game a bit because it's just too easy to get elsewhere or you know they make kits that are they focus on the on the uh the the fomo of it and they come up with a really cool sisters basilica kit and they're like it's only available for a limited time yeah everything (laughs) becomes a limited run and yeah that's the other and they're man if anybody's good at giving you fomo they've mastered that in their marketing <laughs> yeah tremendously so yeah. yeah when i saw how much of the uh stuff in the reveal stream today was made to order i was like oh mother <laughs> <laughs> watch what show you're on campbell yeah the empire empire all the empire stuff yeah me. it's gonna be rough yep. for me that stuff looked good i as soon as i saw it i was like oh i wonder if campbell's seen this yet mm-hmm. <laughs> of course you had <laughs> mm-hmm. I, i'm i'm seeing it and i'm i'm already hurting all right so so then the last last thing i'd like to do is just like kind of give some like inspirational thoughts some jack handy thoughts here for the old (laughs) older people crowd you know but i i would encourage you to experiment with terrain building um mel bows like dave taylor uh published a book by mel bows uh mel bows has a great youtube channel but like there is so much useful information in that book about how to create terrain and how to make it durable and how to experiment that it's definitely worth trying. And there's a lot of YouTube channels out there as well, showing you ideas. (coughs) Excuse me. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you can, you can kind of do whatever you want. Uh, Carl, you you came to a couple of the when we used to exist as G3 Santa Cruz events where we had combinations of uh, plastic card builds, GW yeah. official kits, foam core, uh, you name it, like mixed together in very thematic ways. Like the uh, the <clears throat> Relentless Despair that we made, that was a, a 3D Space Hulk that we, yeah. we built out <clears throat> using... It was MDF for walls, but then using uh, <laughs> resin cast things to add texture to the walls yeah. on there. Yeah. Uh, kind of like the, the demon faces coming out of the walls was all like resin cast stuff that we like glued to MDF. Very simple construction, but yeah, like painted well and everything had grading and uh, and just using. Um, it blew me away at the time. Like it was it, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. And th- like this is 10 plus years <clears throat> ago before we had 3D printing. So we, like the resin casting stuff was actually, you know, resin casting and blocks of Legos and, and pouring yeah. stuff. But but now it's like with access to 3D printing and so many YouTube tutorials and great assets, for, uh, books that have been put out there over the last 30 plus years. There, there are so many resources to tap into to, to bring something to life. Whatever vision you have out there, somebody might not have the exact vision in there, but they have the tools <coughs> to tell you how you can do that yourself. I've seen some grumbling from like old hammer types who are just like all oh, these three D printers and people doing three D models. They're not real hobbyists. They're not the real X Y Z. And to them, I say, well, you're gonna die before I do. So, Pshaw. peace out. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's you're gonna a, die before I do. It's another <clears throat> way of doing the same stuff. It's a different yeah. tool to yeah. get different yeah. results. Yeah. And you don't have to use it if you don't want to. You can you can keep scratch building, making stuff out of literal trash forever. <clears throat> We're not really doing much about making less trash. Um, so go off, have fun. It is yeah. there for you. And if you haven't done this before, yet yeah, scratch build some stuff, make something. It might suck, but you made it, and that's awesome. Yeah. Like yeah. you can make your own set of. If you're like, oh man, I wish I had a GW terrain set. Just look up the measurements of that stuff of those footprints. Make your own. Make it out of yeah. foam core and cork and cardboard and leftover uh, sprues. Leftover sprues. <coughs> leftover yep. details. Like you can make a passable set quite easily. You can make yep. a good looking set with a, not that much more effort. And there 
is like you mentioned there's tons of youtube channels going over this stuff there are old archives of people building this stuff online going back yep. decades if you can pick up one of those old how to build war games train books or that more recent they're so good one they're <clears throat> awesome they're yeah. inspirational like i actually i used uh, one of my display boards i use stuff from this 1996 war games train book to make like the hills and so on on the back yeah by like, yeah. stacking cardboard cut to shape and like mod podging over that like these techniques are all still valid if and they're still available for you they're not going anywhere but if you want to do the new stuff that's awesome and it's also even more available and easier to use than ever yeah all right well with that let's uh take a break and we'll come back and close out the show Just, All right. They've got no respect for lead in their models. That's right. They're huffing and back. They're huffing printer dust instead of chewing on Napoleonics. Back in my day, our brain damage was done with lead. <laughs> on that note, <clears throat> on that note, uh, we've come back to yeah, close out the show. Uh, and and you know, I, I mean, going back to the point, I mean, Campbell already hit this earlier, but but uh, really for me, terrain. You know, again, we did that episode about it being the third army on the table. <clears throat> but for me, it really is. And it really is representative of the immersiveness of this game specifically. I think Age of Sigmar gets a little bit of play there. Um, Warhammer Fantasy for me is always like, oh, where's all the train gone? <laughs> you know, like hey, there's just not because yeah. it gets in the way. I mean, it, yeah. it it's not what it's all about. But for me, I think that's one of the reasons I leaned towards Warhammer 40K when I started. And so that's why it remains important to me. <clears throat> yeah, most, most AOS fields and honestly, especially Warhammer Fantasy fields look kind of like fighting over a golf course, uh, with <laughs> yeah. maybe a, a which, rock formation or building to disrupt your movement, which for a game like that is that's what you want. That's what you need. But yeah, for Plan 40K without that terrain, you're just uh, you're fighting on planet yeah. bowling ball. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you think about historic warfare and it was like <clears throat> two armies on each side of a valley charging down into the middle, meeting at the bottom of that, like you weren't looking for a spot that had a, a ton of terrain in that and no. not even historical war gaming, actual historical war is yeah. Like, yeah. let's, let's find an empty field and run at each other with sticks yeah. until the invention of guerrilla warfare. Yeah. There's yes. like a <laughs> fence. There's like a fence at Gettysburg. And it's like, that is, a, that's a lot. Like that's yeah. a sport. It's just a <laughs> right. farmer's fence. Yeah. That guy runs up to, he's like, how am I supposed to get over this? <laughs> I'm going to roll two <laughs> dice to see if I can get over this or not. <laughs> failed my I'm land raider out. got stuck <clears throat> oh my god if i oh. <laughs> land raiders are in such a good spot right now campbell i know you're I, i'm preaching to the choir there too but oh my god i love my land raider <laughs> I, I i've never been so happy to raid land yeah look at that there goes josh with his land the second one yeah you are i need another vindicator those things are monsters too i wish vindicators <laughs> didn't look so puny they're so puny they're so good but they look so like tiny and cuddly but they're so stocky <laughs> <laughs> yeah, natural born sprinters. Uh, yeah, listen, um, I, I don't mention it here, but I'd love to see people share their terrain projects on social media. You know, we 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 just looked at um, last episode. I think I just you know awarded. I think it was was it Will? I, I can't remember who I was looking at. Their uh, their terrain pieces they were putting together were fantastic. I mean, that was part of the inspiration for oh, me that was, going. Uh, Liam. Oh, uh, Liam. <clears throat> Thank you. Sorry. Uh, sorry, Liam. Uh, and heck with you, Will. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> uh, the um, I, I'd love to see what people are doing because, you know, the uh, Armies on Parade thing just finished up. And it's funny, like I've seen that for so many years and I've always like it kind of just springs up out of nowhere to me. All of a sudden people are like showing their Armies on Parade stuff. And so I kind of think I want to do something with Armies on Parade next year. Nice. And so to do so, I want to add like you know, some, some terrain elements and, and things like that. So it's going to be a bit of a challenge for me. I think we'll see if this actually comes to pass. I haven't made my, my hobby commitment for two months at this point. So let's see what really happens. But I have always wanted to be involved in that. So I'm curious to see what other people have done, especially if you've participated in armies on parade and done terrain pieces around that. I'd love to see what you've done as well. Yeah, building a display board is a very good avenue for doing this yeah. stuff in like yeah. a contained area you've got a finite size a finite time limit finite space limit and you need to make sure it's usable for a lot of models so i feel like 
if you're new to this or just haven't before, build a display board. It's a really yeah. fun terrain project. It's a great point. Sometimes limiting your options by those sizes can actually be the 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 piece you need oh, yeah. so that you're not trying to yeah. pick from a huge plethora of, of stuff. You can just focus on this little thing and that helps. constraint often leads to some really cool creative breakthrough also. Yeah, it's a great it's a great point. Warhammer and constraint don't always go hand in hand <laughs> yeah. or power fist and power fist. But yeah, I, I do recommend you do so. It's a very fun project. You guys got any other last minute things you want to throw in there? Or we we tap this out. And I have so many terrain projects. I think 2025 is going to be the uh, the year of terrain for me. Between Necromunda, 40k, Old World, Legions of Burialis, like yeah, you're so, you're you're screwed. So many projects. I'm just <laughs> just terrain. I'm just gonna try to get my sisters on the table in 2025. That's my that's my go to. That's we a good goal. Get, we didn't even get to talk about boards like molded terrain boards oh son of a store all right hold on well let's talk about those real quick we got a couple right. minutes still sure, sure, sure. i have two realm of battle boards mm-hmm. not to mention i have probably two tables worth of game of the forge world city tile boards yeah um people tend to hate on them a lot because one they're noisy <laughs> and two uh, the models can slide down the hills a little bit. Sometimes if you flock them, they don't really slide down the hills. Um, I have to tell you, like, I actually really like them. Like I am a big fan of them. I bought the expansion tiles that Forge World put out that were like the crash thunder Hawk. And I have like the one that has like the, the bunker mm-hmm. and they sometimes, and I'm not yeah, saying okay. every game takes place on them. But when I bring it out, it's like, oh, this is like another new experience. Like it, it can be a little bit different and it can be nice, you know, Add to occasionally mix the, it up. I'll always remember that Salamanders <laughs> and Tyranid game that you and I played. We put the Crash Thunderhawk down there, which you painted as Salamanders. Uh, yeah, mostly because Jeff had, played Salamanders. Yeah. <laughs> we <laughs> had just that amazing game and just having terrain like add all that much immersion and narrative to a game before we even got to the table is yeah. pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I have a Roma battle board that I remember buying when it was new and like carrying that thing two miles from the game store to my apartment. Oh my <laughs> God. The thing's heavy as hell. Like, it, yeah. as it, get, and it gets heavier when you're uh, <laughs> on Maya 1.5. Uh, but I did the whole thing with it flocked. I even like touched up a few years ago to like get the rocks and all that stuff. Yeah. And I still use that when I play just Sigmar because I play more casual with AOS. I'm not as beholden to like, the do you have the age of Sigmar themed one? No, I do not okay. have that one. Um, I remember seeing that and I'm like, I don't, I didn't love the aesthetic of it. I actually think it looks really cool. It looks cool, but it's not like what I want from battlefield, you know, fair. I like my fields to be kind of versatile and a grassy field is pretty versatile. Most things can fight over it. You know, whether it's fantasy 40 K, whatever. Yeah. Um, save for the giant <coughs> skulls, if the skull, the skull play. pits everywhere. <laughs> yeah. That, that kind of pigeonholes it. Like I remember when they'd show uh Lord of the Rings games and white dwarf, they'd green stuffed over the skull yeah. pits and yeah. locked over it. Yeah. Um, which is fine. Which is fine. And again, like I remember they even had um another white dwarf. They did a resin pour over the skull pits and it was, ice. yes, it was a, yeah, snowboard. I saw that. It looked and good. It was so cool. Uh, but again, like even with these pre-made things, you can do a lot of stuff. But I also had the um, the secret weapon tablescapes boards, which are like yes. one foot by one foot tiles. And I have a four by six city board of that, uh, which unfortunately I can never expand because they, they're out of business uh, right. that I call Skull and Grad. And it is very fun to play like urban warfare over this board. But I have played over this city board so many times over the last 10 plus years that it's mostly shelved at the moment. Um, yeah, just because I want something different, um, right? But I feel like boards like that. <clears throat> I remember my old game club had big two by four slabs of MDF they painted and textured and not yep. really modeled stuff on, but painted for thematic boards and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Have, like mm-hmm. twenty of them for events, uh, and even the this war game strain book has a guide on how to do that. Uh, yeah, and I remember seeing suggestions of like hanging them in like studs in your garage so you could just like keep them up vertically that way uh, or. <laughs> whatever and it's it's another just cool thing you can do and i always thought it was neat with uh realm of battles or Re- using realm of battle tile or just custom building your own thing for a display board yeah. having that part of your display board be part of your home table so you can yeah. just just take a chunk plug of it home in table with you and be like here's my display board all right i'm done back into the gaming shed it goes or whatever which i wasn't a huge cool. fan of the games work the gw not the forge but the gw city tile one they came yeah, out that with one 
<clears throat> it's, it's a bit of a fail. Uh, like dice wouldn't roll flat on it because it had so many grooves and stuff, yeah. so you couldn't roll Too dice on it. Sure, can be a problem. <laughs> when we played at uh, Warhammer World, they had a bunch of those because they were new at the time, in like right. 2014 or whatever. And the gutters, because that's the difference. The, yes. the, the secret weapon miniatures one didn't have gutters. You'd still right. get craters and so on. So rolling on was kind of kind of iffy sometimes. But this one the GW one had gutters and every single die would always get cocked landing yeah. on those. Yeah. And I had like a tactical squad with rerolls to hit and half my dice would fall in the gutter. So I have to reroll those. Cool. Now I need to reroll my misses. Half of those would fall in the gutter. I need to reroll those every time, four times. It slows the game down a bit because of the stupid yeah. board and it looked great. It looks beautiful. It's still like kind of like, if you play Chaos Gate Demon Hunters, I think that's mm-hmm. still kind of like the ground texture on a bunch of the maps there and so on. But yeah, it was. I don't. F- I feel like mats, ha- like the neoprene mats, like Table Wars got, have absolutely become the standard. And even GW's tried to make one, didn't really take off. Uh, yeah. So I feel like that's kind of yeah. where I think yeah, that's where I, games I, are going for the storage and playability. Yeah. Yeah. I will. Uh, I can hear right now the dice hitting the realm of battle board. <laughs> like it is a very, very distinctive noise. I will admit the dice, yeah, the dice rolling on uh, a fat mat or whatever a table or fat mat like is 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 a quiet quieter experience. I, I think it's actually a nicer experience in many ways. I do sometimes miss, and and every like I said, every now and then I'll break these out because I want like an actual board with with varying heights and, and terrain, um, you know, it becomes less of a, less of a, um, it just becomes less of a, a two dimensional thing and more of a three dimensional thing, which really adds a lot to, to, to it. There was a YouTuber way back in the day that was doing these, <clears throat> I think it was striking scorpion yes. something. 82. Yeah. 82. Yeah. Um, he, he would have like really amazing uh, terrain on his tables when he was filming his battle reports back in the day. And uh, those, I remember seeing like he, what he was using, if, if I'm not mistaken, were effectively floor tiles that were 12 inches by 12 inches. <coughs> Excuse me. And then he would decorate those and so then he had this module modular table he could put together and it looked fantastic. It looked fantastic. I had never really thought about that. Yeah. There are ready made things out there and <laughs> again, that's the old DIY spirit there. Uh, yeah. Not yeah. Not going to speak on his whole shtick, but I do think yeah. that is a cool, I think there were other issues with him, but, uh-huh. but he, he definitely had like great table looking. Yeah. We'll leave it there. <laughs> we'll leave it there. Let's yeah. Let's leave on the positive here. <clears throat> Or hammers for everybody, Campbell. <laughs> yes, it is. And and we are yeah, yeah everybody. Okay, uh, so listen. On that note, <laughs> we have. Uh, please leave us reviews on iTunes. It helps others find the show. We really do appreciate it. We are one of the highest rated podcasts on iTunes, and we'd like to keep it that way. So, if you have a problem with something we've talked about, by all means, let us know. Uh, you can write Josh at theindependentcharacters dot com or Carl at theindependentcharacters dot com or Reach out to us through any of our social media avenues. We have a great Facebook group, <clears throat> uh, which uh, is full of really supportive and, and wonderful people. Vibrant are, and active hobbyists. Uh, why don't I just let you write this copy, Josh? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, and you can go for the past 20 years. I guess it and you something. can go to the independent characters.com to one purchase the independent characters.com t-shirt, please. <laughs> <laughs> And two, uh, uh, you can join our Patreon if you're looking for that. We're producing some bonus material for that. Uh, Campbell, That's we got we got Dan. We got Dan still out. You're with us for a while still, which is yeah. awesome. We really like having you here. Yeah, oh, it's good. Sure. Good having you on board. <clears throat> you got to disagree more though. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, uh, you're you're doing stuff for Goonhammer. Can you yeah. can you give us a plug there for Goonhammer? Yeah, uh, so the Tabletop Battles app, which you should be using even if you're a more casual player. like It's just hugely useful as a scorekeeping app. 74 to 75 last night, buddy. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> uh, 
it just updated with kill team 2024 <coughs> support i put out a little ad for that awesome uh i'm working on a review for a, another non-gw game for goonhammer right now so keep your eyes on the goonhammer youtube for that but we're still putting out little unit focus shorts like three times a week we're doing death guard right now so if you want to get quick hit content on learning how to use various death guard griblies and grublies going over to the goonhammer youtube channel and check that out uh, nice i also as alluded to my 40k badcast co-host dan is out for a while so uh we have a show it's you might have heard of it we'll be back eventually but in the interim we've got some bonus content carl i've uh, got <clears throat> you on the hook to do some bonus content with me for the badcast so yeah keep an eye over there ear over there i guess uh, in the coming weeks months slash whatever for even more talking about gaming goodness or whatever we choose to talk about it's a bit more free flowing over there especially on the patreon side of things if you ever want to hear carl swear yeah if you want to hear uh, <laughs> the the dreaded carl cuss head on over to the 40k badcast we've done a few collab episodes Bat- battle brothers helping battle brothers all right <clears throat> 30 minutes of carl cussing yeah, <laughs> it's gonna be a bonus <laughs> it's yeah, just me swearing cussing tape <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, until next time, this is Carl. This is Josh. This is Campbell. We're coming to you from the Astronomicon where the army should take center stage. But where terrain is the third army. And the terrain train keeps a rolling. Yeah, it does. All right. Thank you so much. And we will see you next time. This episode of The Independent Characters is protected by the Creative Commons license. If you have further questions as to its use, you can find information on the front page at theindependentcharacters.com.